Good afternoon to everybody. I um, would like to welcome you to the Observatory of Cervantes at Harvard University, uh, the Observatory of the Spanish Language and the Spanish Cultures in the United States. Uh, my name is Victoria Yarlori Whitney, and I'm the program coordinator. And I would like to welcome you on behalf of our director, Professor Francisco Moreno Fernandez, who was unable to be here today. Um, the objective of the observatorio is uh, to create a center that will serve as a point of international reference for study, analysis, and diagnosis of the state of the Spanish language in the United States, the linguistic minorities, the teaching of Spanish, and the culture and thought in Spanish. For that, the observatory conducts analysis, studies, and reports concerning the social and linguistic state of the Spanish language and its communities, and it's a forum for research, exchange, and debate among experts from Harvard University, from other universities, Spanish-speaking countries, and Spain. Uh, we promote and celebrate the identity of Hispanic and Latino culture within Harvard University. And within this context, we're very happy to and pleased to host today this workshop, included in our series uh, named Conversations in the Observatory and titled Transnational Musical Modernities. We welcome all of you, all the guests, um, especially Professor Madrid, Alejandro Madrid, who was <coughs> a visiting professor here at Harvard University last fall, uh, funded by the Observatory Cervantes, and all our uh, keynote speakers, Professor Cohen, Professor Party, and Professor Birnbaum Quintero. Uh, just a Quick logistic note, the doors are going to be open today and tomorrow until 5.30 p.m., but know that it's a secure building, so you will need your HUID, your Harvard ID, to access the building after 5.30, so just so you know. And uh, without any further delay, I'm just going to leave you with uh, Felipe, Felipe Ledesma, a graduate student from the Department of Music. Thank you, Victoria, uh, and thank you for all the work you put into this. Uh, we appreciate the support of the Cervantes Observatory, so thank you personally. Uh, welcome to everyone. I hope you had like, a safe trip. Thank you, professors, for being here and for like uh, participating and helping us students into like, working through our papers. Just like, a couple of notes about the format, just to rem remind you. We're, we'll have two panels per day. We'll have between 35 and 40 minutes per student to discuss each student's paper. We'll start with a short presentation by the student about his or her project, followed by respond, the, the respondents, uh, and then we have a small discussion. Uh, there will be keynotes at 5 p.m. today and tomorrow. Uh, tonight there's a dinner. If you have an RSVP, let me know there's still space. And there's tomorrow a concert with Palo Negro, who is Sergio's band at Cornell. Highly recommended. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, also, a couple of notes if you're not from the area. Tonight at 9. Uh, there's going to be Stephen Feld's Voices in the Red Forest presentation at the HFA. I can send my information later. And there's also an interesting uh, conference at the, uh, what's the name? The, one of the centers of Harvard, one of the many centers of Harvard, <laughs> of the slavery in the university system. So like, uh, I'll get, I can roughly, on the roughly of the center, right? Uh, so if you want more information about it, let me know. And without further ado, uh, let's go to Sarah and um, thanks, Felipe. Thanks, Victoria. And thanks, Michael and Alejandro. Yes. And everyone else for um, your comments and for being here. Um, I guess you prob it's probably the most obvious thing about this paper is that it's sort of a patchwork at this point. It's um, a section for my dissertation that has uh, different uh, sections of conference papers grafted onto it to sort of flesh out or look at points and directions where I want to develop it. So um, the dissertation, this section of the, the dissertation is about Timba and Casino in Havana, New York City. Um, the section of the chapter from which you've seen the section is about New York City and this chap the section is about the musicians in New York City presently. Um, so there's a little bit, uh, there's a, a little um, let me set the work that I'm doing on Timba at the very beginning. Um, so pointing to any la banda, the idea of any género. Um, but there's more that needs, I think, that needs to be added there. And if you have sort of feedback on what's there or what needs to be there, it's, um, just know that I am also thinking about that. And um, 
for example, La Charanga Manera is a group that I talk about a lot in um, my dissertation, um, particularly with respect to the sort of the popification and commodification of certain elements of timba. Um, I also talk about the 70s, but I think that might be too much of a digression for this paper. Um, and what else do I want to say about it? The other thing that's kind of was a last minute addition is the first example of, about Juan Pablo Canado and the Padres de Cuba and this version of Cali Luna Cali Sol, which I think is a really exciting example. I just didn't know if he was going to give me the score until like two days before I had to turn this um, section in um, from my dissertation. So um, it's, it's kind of like my very first attack at that, and I'd like to do more. Um, sort of perhaps transcribe and want to know the original and then um, do something. But I like having a score, a composer's score, because I think a lot of my work is transcriptions of live performances of, of improvisation, and so I think the contrast is interesting, but um, I might also, I just, I'm not sure what to do with that, so that's another place where if you guys um, see how that could balance out or contrast with or add to the other sections that are more developed, um, that would be really welcome feedback. Um, so I also, the other thing I wanted to apologize about is the um, formal outlines, which are like totally hard to read right now, and I'm in the process of fixing those and making them vertical. I don't, I'm not a fan of vertical formal outlines, but I think they'll look better on this, in this format. Um, so, so I guess the questions, I don't know if this is what I'm supposed to say or if I can wrap up now. <laughs> Um, I guess the questions that I have are just taking into consideration those that I pointed out as sort of rough edges, rough spots, and the general kind of plan that I have. Um, how does it look like? This is something that I'd like to develop into an article. Um, what do you think? Is it, um, does it, is it clear? Is the direction or the arguments, is the material clear? Um, particularly about those spots that I talked about, like is what should I, what more should I say about Timba so that we can really appreciate what Timba is in New York City and what how, how New York and Timba are interacting in particular ways. Um, what arguments or examples seem most convincing or valuable? What needs work? What questions to raise for you? Also, if there's feedback on the scores or the formal diagrams, except for how hard they are to read right now, um, or any suggestions about how to sort of to make visual aids more useful. Um, those would all be really welcome. Okay, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> you have a listening. One of the reasons you want to write of the shining on the music. That's not Okay. Um, so, Sarah, your essay uh, offers a detailed ethnography about <coughs> in the economy in your city and its consequences on contemporary musical practice. By taking us from Havana in the 1990s to contemporary New York City, you effectively inform us of the history of this music and dance genre, or intergenre, as you remind us of Danilo Rosco's memorable label to it, um, and explore the changing attitudes towards it uh, among older and younger fans of Timba in terms of nostalgia and the consolidation of a classic repertoire uh, of classic repertories and epistemologies about this music. Uh, in doing this, you provide a meticulous discussion of the role uh, of covers play in Cuba and abroad in the production of these canons. Um, your work successfully combines ethnography with close reading of songs and comparative music ana analysis that allows us to follow the changing trajectories of some of these songs in the transnational imaginary about tradition and cosmopolitan film that influenced in the musicians in New York City. Um, this type of interdisciplinary methodology is commendable, and I would add that uh, you have been successful in combining intellectual work that can sometimes be perceived to occupy dialectically opposite uh, spaces. Um, so the following comments go from the general to the particular in an attempt to challenge some of the possible theoretical shortcomings of this portion of your project. And I'm aware that I do this without knowing uh, if maybe some of these questions may be answered in other parts of the, of the project, of the dissertation. Uh, as well as to provide specific questions about the particular case study you chose to include in the essay. So transnationalism is a central theoretical aspect of your work. However, this particular essay focuses on how transnational flows, and you mentioned a little bit about this, 
uh, inform just one axis of the larger uh, process of interaction, which is New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, so your work explores how trans the transnational flows of uh, uh, musicians, repertories, and information has changed the practice of timba in New York City. Uh, and I would argue that a truly effective transnational project would also need to take into account uh, how these flows have impacted the practice of timba in Cuba, right? Uh, so, for example, how, what is the relationship between these artists, the timba artists in New York City, and the scene in Cuba? Do they go back to Cuba? Do they have, uh, is there a network of uh, exchange of information or performance practice? Um, you take the, uh, the notion of intergenre from Danilo Rosa as a central aspect of your theorization about timba. Uh, without questioning um, some of its possible shortcomings. Uh, this has been explored not only by Cuban musicologists, such as Leonardo da Costa, Marcela Grande, Marcel de Leon, Jesús uh, Gomez Cairo, but also by scholars in Latin America and the United States, such as um, Rubén López Cano and uh, Robin Moore, uh, in relation to further critiques to conventional ideas of, uh, about genre and musical style. So could this discussion move beyond purely musical elements to deal with how dancers, audiences, fans, and music entrepreneurs in their, uh, in their speech, discourse, and embodied practice also help uh, reconfigure what, what timba is? Um, so how would speaking of timba as a performance complex, as Robin Moore and I have discussed the dance songs, may further problematize uh, Orozco's notion of intergender? So that's a question. Um, on a different note, I also wonder about the neoliberal overtones of the type of economic networks these musicians belong to. Uh, I'm especially interested in the notion of precarity um, that seems to great, greatly inform their job and rehearsal practices, uh, but also the idea of the musician as a self-reliant and independent worker. Uh, how do these concepts and this and in discussion of neoliberalism may enrich your theoretical framework and further illustrate the discussion uh, on these specific case studies? So I have also some very specific questions about the case studies. Um, maybe like four, five. So you mentioned that Gonzalo Grau's Ave um, Kevoy opens with a quotation from Richard Strauss, Dos Pop Zaratustra. Uh, and you mentioned that it may be an invocation of Stanley Kubrick, right? Uh, I wonder if also it might be an invocation of, of or more sort of obscure homage to someone like uh, Emilio Dato, who made a version of, of uh, also uh, those books that to uh, in a jazz sort of jazz sort of version in the 1970s. Uh, and if that's the case, maybe there's some of a Inter-Latino connection that's unexplored. There. Um, second question: Your essay explores uh, musical meaning largely on the locus of production. Uh, so I have ser several questions about reception and how, and how timba is heard by audiences, dancers, and fans. Um, for example, uh, can fans and audiences hear and appreciate the difference between timba and salsa? Um, which are some of the musicologists also tend to dwell on the differences. So they are very, for a for, 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 from a musicological perspective, from a music theory perspective, they're very rich, right? Uh, but I wonder if listeners actually, I mean, and dancers can hear the difference and can actually act upon the vision if they do this. Uh, if they do, does that um, have an impact on their dancing and their demands of, for specific genres of music? Um, or how do fans understand the type of innovation, innovation one uh, hears into Kidu Herrera and Andrew's jams that you analyze very, very thoroughly? Uh, and are they important to this? Okay. So, another question. Uh, Actually, should, should I stop and sort of open more a dialogue than me just like sharing this? I feel like I'm... There's no fix for my really. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll finish. Okay. Uh, I wonder if there are any dif differences in how timba musicians in New York and Cuba relate to the idea of, uh, of timba, of the, uh, to the music uh, as a continued negotiation between jazz and pop that you mentioned uh, towards the end of the paper. 
Uh, is this negotiation more prevalent about, among New York musicians? Uh, or Cubans uh, in Cuba still emphasizing this relationship? And finally, I wanted to uh, comment on the dogmatic approach to, to clave that you described in relation to your uh, say, timba practices, uh, that somehow is maybe trying to validate itself on some sort of perceived uh, dogmatism from Cuban practices, uh, which actually seems to me more of a somehow recent invention, I think. Uh, because when one listens to early recordings of Cuban music, both in Cuba and abroad, one listens to this uh, crossing club all the time. Mm -hmm. So this seems to be that, <coughs> that the idea of a dogma is, is something new recent. So I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, I guess so that you bring up a couple times um, Havana and New York and how there, what kinds of exchanges happen between Havana and New York and how what does Havana look like today. The so the whole trajectory of the dissertation narrative is kind of a chronological one as well as a thematic one. So it focuses first on dance, then on the cas cas casino emerges first, then on Tima, and then on New York City because that's where they arrive eventually. Um, so there is, I definitely, um, in my re research I've been trying to think about and, and find um, uh, sort of ways to compare present-day diva performance and jazz diva performance in uh, Havana and New York. Um, but it plays, it's definitely the Havana scene is, plays a lesser role in, in the narrative in general. Um, so yeah, that's maybe that's something that I should think about incorporating more. I mean, I guess the, the, short, my, the short answer of my findings or something is that in Havana, um, timba bands are still big bands. Um, they're still dance bands. Um, there's more of a nostalgic kind of classic timba that's popular now, like Alexander Abreu, um, or, or timbaton, or cubaton, um, like Los Cuatro, or Timba Live, even in Miami. Um, this is a, that's, what, this, that's where timba is going, timba. And I, I, I'm still looking for small combos that um, incorporate Timba into their jazz performances. So I have, really haven't found that. And I've asked, I've interviewed a bunch of jazz musicians now, but um, they just don't seem as interested in, in doing that. I think the economy is, I don't know, like we can sort of think about why that is, but I, I haven't found sort of small combos that are comparable to like Federico's group or Ariakin's group. I was wondering if that has anything to do with the fact that many of the musicians have to play in sort of um, recognize, officially recognize ensembles for, and by the government. Yeah, I mean, there's there's more and more um, uh, sort of entrepreneurship in, in the music scene. Mm -hmm. um, there are still these big bands, but Timba, you don't have to be in a big band to play Timba. I mean, I think that's part of what I show in, in these examples. Mm -hmm. um, Timba is a set of practices that are mobile and can be applied in different ways, different kinds of material. Um, and so Cubans and tree, like jazz trios, like um, I'm forgetting this guy's name, who's been coming to New York a lot recently. He has a trio. He's pretty well established. Um, Pianist. Yeah. Um, Alejandro Falcón. No. Robert Roberto Monseca. Roberto Monseca. Um, he does a lot of really kind of. He does a lot of interesting poppy stuff. But anyway, he's just like someone that I was one of the people that I interviewed and was like, "Why do you ever use timba?" And, so that's I was I was sort of looking in that scene. There's a lot of groups, musicians that travel a lot, um, and have flex have like long-standing groups with similar that are similar in other ways to Adiaki's group, for example, like intimacy, like uh, broad vocabularies to see if they integrate those practices and they and they really don't. Um, so far, that's how what I've found. <clears throat> May I ask you something very yeah, interesting sure. in relation to that? Um, when you were mentioning this kind of, uh, if I um, understand it correctly, um, somewhat kind of a lack of interest in the part of the by musicians kind of getting into incorporating those kind of, like the, the big form and the big sound of the of, of timba productions into a smaller jazz a combos. What about these Cuban musicians who navigate between both worlds, I mean, so who play both in the 
a like in, in the jazz scene in Havana in a small combos and who lead all one some of these big timba orchestras. I'm thinking in particular of these I don't remember his name is Alain Alan the, the very long Perez. Per yeah. Alain Perez? Yeah, he lives in in Spain. But yeah, but he's really still, I mean, at least last year he was still very prominent in, 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 in Havana. Yeah. But and it was very interesting, I mean, so one night playing with a small jazz combo, and then the following night leading his big kind of timba orchestra. Yeah, I so think that Alain's a great example that supports what I, sort of what I've been finding, which is that in Havana, like, the jazz musicians are more, like, for example, um, Harold Diaz and Youssef, Yusef Diaz, their brothers that play um, with Alexander Abreu, they, um, or one plays with Isaac, one plays with Alexander, and they're both like super jazz nerds, and they have all these side projects, and, and they're, all their side projects are like fusion projects, and they're, they're straight ahead projects. They're, they, they don't, they're, they're team battles, but they're not, they just, their side projects are just completely different. But Alain, like Pedrito, Ariadne, all these, and I don't, so anyway, we, I'm not sure how much further this goes right now, but um, yeah, he, he, he does a similar thing. I think Madrid is another really interesting scene mm -hmm. to look at. There's a lot of Cubans of that generation there doing interesting stuff who bring a really strong foundation in Timba mm -hmm. and do different things with it. Um, with the flamenco so yeah. and smaller and larger combos and that kind of, yeah. Some of the things that, that I have to say are actually kind of fairly similar, um, and that have to do with, I mean, my, my first let me say I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the, um, the, the dance paper that you presented at SEM last year. Um, I love what you're doing here. I love this music. Um, the, the, the transcriptions and the ethnographic elements are really right on. Um, and there's, there's, you, you definitely have a, um, a project that I think um, that, that has legs, and that, um, and I think that you can do a lot of things with. It. So congratulations for that. The 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 question that I have for me that really animates pretty much everything else that I have to say is that I'm curious what exactly is timba here, right? Because even many of the musicians don't see or identify specifically what they're doing as timba. They don't market it as being timba, but yet there's something that's really fundamental for you about Timba here, and the best definition that I could actually, and then Timba itself turns out in your analysis to be in, in, in intergenero. So the more you sort of push at Timba, the more it sort of seems to slip out, out, of, um, out, of, out of view. And actually the best definition that I found of, of Timba here was actually about a definition of Timbero, which comes towards the end, in which you say a Timbero, in other words, someone engaged with rumba culture, and raised with a 90s attitude, free on the streets of New York. Right? And so that actually speaks to a certain, um, a certain way in which the question of genre or style is actually not really the question that I feel like you're, well, it is, but, um, but I wonder how much your, your loyalty to the specific term of, of, of timba is, um, it coincides with the fact that it's also exactly that which is being pushed by the, by the, by the musicians quite deliberately in ways that, I mean, some of these musicians, and maybe I'm a, a bad person to, to speak to this because I think I know something about Timba, but I, but, I, but I certainly don't know as much as you do. But the musicians that I know often speak about Timba as being a kind of commercial music that takes place in Cuba, and so they're, they're pushing things in other directions. And so their actual use of Timba sometimes I mean, it, it, it certainly, um, what they have to say about things like reggaeton is, you know, certainly more favorable, but there's a sort of continuum of the more commercial, the more experimental, and so on. And so, um, I'm curious whether you want to, I mean, I think that you could, you could either um, dispense with timba and, and think about timbero is what you're talking about, is to say that it's, it's the people and where they come from and what they're, um, what they're, I, I, and I think that rumba is really important. The fact that you say that they come from rumba culture is really important. And that sort of comes through in that, I guess it's the last transcription with Pedrito and um, I forget who the other guy is. Um, yeah, that was with Mauricio, yeah. right. And so um, I think that that's really important. I think it's something about experience in some ways, or generation, um, the special period, whatever, whatever that is, um, more than the actual style. The second thing that I think about the about intergenero is I wonder what isn't in intergenero, right? It's almost the yeah. same question, right? Like, 
Um, most genres and styles that I can think of have a sort of like, you know, the Wittgenstein family resemblance. Like they don't all have whatever, you know, uh, green eyes and, and black hair and um, whatever, but maybe this one has green eyes and maybe this one has black hair and this one has big ears and whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I wonder um, what, what exactly is the, is the work that you want genre to do for you? And the, the thing that really comes through for me, but that I think is interesting, is the ways in which whatever that is interacts with the neoliberal context that Alejandro talks about. Um, and I, I think that it's a very important part of the of the analysis because it also it also means that essentially, if there's no practice space, then the gig is the rehearsal, yeah. right? So there's no other kind of gig that's not going to be in some ways kind of risky, kind of experimental, kind of playful. And at the same time, that's going to that's going to need a, a, a musical level that's already here, just to sort of get there, yeah. right? Um, and in many ways, that's the thing that's both so wonderful about the music, and that's so perfect about for neoliberalism, right? You know, you could say that in the 19th century, the Walter Pater thing about all art ascribes to the condition of music. Well, now all work. <laughs> As, you know, uh, should under neoliberalism should be like musicianship. That is to say, you don't get paid that much. You're an entrepreneur and you love it, and that's what you're doing. <laughs> and you have these kinds of intimacies at the same time as you're working. Yeah. Right. And so I think that there's um, that that making that um, making that connection, drawing that connection out even further, um, might be useful. And then the last thing I have to say is that I, I wasn't sure if this is exactly a, a dissertation chapter or an article, um, but there's some like vocabulary that's sort of brought up here and that isn't quite defined in, yeah. until later or just sort of mentioned. So that's just something to look over. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean this is this is, but it was it was great to read. I'm really excited about your work. Yeah. Um, so team but so I've been I've resisted um, the people. I've really been thinking about the forms when I think about casino and team but because I think the important thing in New York is that it's, there are Cubans who are really important in the scene, but they're not all Cubans. Juan is one of the most important players and the most important basis in his Greek, you know, and, and it's so um, but he's also he knows the book. He has the education. He's in, he, in New York. He engages with those like the York Bundles and other musicians. But um, so I so I, I in the second chapter. So this is part of why I should probably beef up the beginning. I guess if I want to stick to the this set of mobile practices, right? The set of that's, I guess that's what I think that what I want genre to do for me is um, be ways be a way of working with the music. Which maybe is not usually how we think of genre, but it's what I think of as for Timba and especially as its mobility. Um, but I, I, I outlined sort of rhythmic and tempo and formal transformations that, that we see, for example, in Gonzalo's um, re re remake of Carisol. And we see, and also Nadia Akhmi, that's part of what I'm trying to say about Nadia Akhmi's piece, is how she's transforming the rhythmic into to Timba. Timba. Um, <laughs> So I so yeah, I think that, yeah team, definitely there's also this yes I don't know it's a tension that I'm still I guess dealing with but I, but I at least my approach so far has really been to focus on the, the practices that make make music timba. Can I say one other thing about yeah. about timba as a genre? Um, one of the things that strikes me about timba as a genre is that it's built up on these sort of movements of increasing intensity, like that's mm -hmm. how it's set up. It's all about sort of tension and then a little release and then a little more tension and it keeps building up. And yeah. It's almost like um, like contra dance or something in a certain way, like that it has these sort of sections, these yeah. really discrete sort of sections, the machinas and all this different stuff. Um, and it, it strikes me that that is one of the things that for jazz in particular, and for some of the jazz musicians, American or wherever they're from, jazz musicians that are watching people like Perito, that's the thing, that's one of the things that's the most um, striking about timba jazz or that jazz played by timberos or timba yeah. that is influenced, whatever that, whatever that thing is. Um, yeah. So I, I think it would be interesting to also sort of be, you mentioned it a couple times, but most of, most of your analysis is sort of musical textures yeah. at discrete moments and yeah. sort of form I think might be a, a good thing to that too. Yeah, so that, I was going to do that without Yakmi, but it's good to know that it didn't really come through that well because um, the gear, like the gears. The gears. Is, um, the important, the gears. Concept and this this building this building up so this and this kind of goes back to Alejandro's other 
question, comment about reception. And um, the dance, I guess the main recipients or receivers, <coughs> speakers for that position are, are dancers. Um, and and this and the idea of the gozadera, right? The final, which is kind of I've I've taken that general, more generally term that's thrown around in commercial and non-commercial senses, and and used it to describe like this like the peak moment of a timba event, which is and I'm calling it an event as opposed to a complex, but it's kind of the same idea where music and dance, music musicians and dancers, music and dance work together to. In these in these feedback cycles to kind of keep moving, that's managed by the lead singer, or managed by the musical director, or both, or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, and then and the goal is like this gozadera, this, this moment of, of communal sensual um, uh, ecstasy, basically. Um, which isn't in here because this is I really focused on the music, and maybe I should maybe that's part of the message is like to back off a little bit from just all the musical detail and and put in put back in some of the reception, some of the like the point of the music, which is that in some ways. Um, I do feel that there is to to back, but just to put the bit out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, as you know, since this is. This is related to your dissertation. It's, sometimes it's hard to keep track of what's where. Yeah. And also, I, I totally, um, I mean, yeah, no, I, I understand that. that makes sense. Um, what else, what else? Um, yeah, I think that I'm black. I feel like I have like there's someone else I was going to say, but now I'm forgetting what it is. So. Um. Sure, I mean, we have a couple of minutes more, so, okay. okay. Yeah, no, no, I just, I just wanted just to bring it to attention it's something that is very interesting in this idea of the <coughs> a, cons timba, like the performance practice around timba as some kind of nostalgia I in Cuba, and, and Michael was pointing that as well, and in the sense that um, there is also, I mean, it's not only, I mean, besides the commercial side of timba, it's, it's also, the construction of timba as a genre and the construction of timba in terms of all these um, increasing intensity in the performance as, uh, as an attempt to uh, create a different generic space from salsa in particular. I think that's like, like, like this, the nostalgic trajectory in which to a certain extent uh, timba was perceived as, okay, this is our own thing, I mean like the, the kind of a recognition that that was due salsa, but the, the, I mean, the, like the Cuban, the recognition of the Cuban roots that wasn't like commercially acknowledged in salsa, but but timba is constructed much more like this actual Cuban commercial original prior different from salsa, but, but kind of building its own scenes. And I think that kind of plays a significant role also in the nostalgic appropriation of timba, and eventually in the in the kind of reluctance of certain musicians in just leaving that, letting that go. Yeah? So like this is the, the like some kind of proprietary space that we have created and we right. attach to it mm -hmm. rather than letting it be transformed into something else. Right. Yeah. yeah. Salsa is definitely a foil here. You sort of feel. That. I was actually curious about um, what. Because salsa is itself so manifest, it's this like sort of seventies, well clearly Calle Luna, Calle Sol is like seventies classic yeah. funny and salsa. But there's also like, you know, um, salsa in Colombia we call it salsa de alcoba, salsa romantica. Mm -hmm. There's a whole world of of salsa which sort of positions itself differently along these different, you know, continua of what whatever authenticity, of commerciality, of you know, sensuality, mm -hmm. of uh, you know, uh, political content, all of these different things are there. Um, yeah, that's I I I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's just me um, feeling like I want to stick up for salsa. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I mean salsa is salsa is itself a complicated um, sort of phenomenon. Um, yeah. But I, I think that that was perhaps the, the point that you made it much more clear. I mean, the sense in which there is this sense of authenticity built around timba in opposition to salsa. Yeah, and it's part of this experience, and so going to Cuba, and so it's just like having the real team experience in, right. in Havana that you would have right. elsewhere, right. Yeah, as opposed of these other 
non-pure world of salsa or right. whatever. I mean, so always this opposition between timba and salsa, I think, is so interesting. Because in the end, both kind of come together in the jazz arena. So jazz, regard, it's kind of like this contest, contested side for both musicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Nobody has sitting here, so we can just move to Matt since we don't have time. But, all right. Thank Best thanks, Sarah. All right. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. Uh, thank you all for for uh, reading our work. Or purportedly reading our work, it's also fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not <laughs> reporting our work. I won't talk very much, I'll talk for just about as long for those of you that surreptitiously skip my writing if you don't mind. It's okay. Um, I should start by saying that the title of this piece is misleading and it won't, it won't remain. This I, I wrote this title when I was sort of writing this SEM paper and thinking that, you know, this is more a title of the larger project, right? And so this paper is more along the lines of Transformismo Masculino and really Grupo Remy's performance in Cuba's sexual revolution. I thought I would contextualize the sexual revolution a little bit before we start talking, before I get your feedback. Um, but actually, maybe I won't do so much of that, since it sounds like there's a lot to be said, and I want to hear what you have to say. Um, I guess the context I'll give is, you know, the sexual revolution I'm referring to, which I don't think I get into too much in the paper, is perhaps this shifting attitude on the, behalf, on the part of the Cuban state in the last, say, 20 years toward um, gender and sexually transgressive citizens. Um, so, of course, the, the, the well-worn historic narrative that I don't sort of spell out is this move from UMAP, right, from the labor camps of the 1960s to then um, continued sort of repression of a different sort through, through uh, the Mariel Boat Lift and then the special period after the fall of the Soviet Union shifting to this like wider acceptance of um, you know, sort of non-normative genders and sexualities in Cuba. Notably, Fidel Castro apologizes for the UMAP camps in 2005. By 2008, gender reassignment surgery is funded by the state. Um, and then starting in 2008, Mariela Castro um, starts having these um, yearly jornadas contra la homofobia y la transphobia, which I sort of document. Um, Maria Castro is the daughter of the president, right, and is this very prominent figure in Cuba generally, but certainly as, as, a, as the helm of the National Center for Sex Education. So one problem I have with the way that the, the jornada has been depicted by the amazing scholar, by, by Abel Sierra Madero and Francis Negro Monterrey, who are wonderful scholars who I love and I love their work, but there's a, a, dis, a very sharp sort of paranoia about the state in, in their work and, and about the, 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 the idea that the sexual revolution can't be anything more than the state either trying to just accumulate more citizens under its power or to try and install Mariela as the next president, which is like, obviously, that's what I like, think. There's, no, like, there's no doubt. Um, probably, probably not the next president, but, like, but right after that. Um, so that's, that's sort of where I'm intervening. And, and my conceit is that the, the drag king performance of these women who I work with um, complicates this really uh, homogenizing reading, and that actually there are agents who are participating in the sexual revolution in particular ways while pushing against it. It's not really just about the state's power over over these um, over the discourse, right? So I'm, I'm, anyway, that's what I'm trying to sort of tease out. And some of the things that I think that they do, right, is in, on the one hand, they, the, the women that I'm working with point to a heterogeneity of sort of, of, of uh, usages of the sexual revolution in that they're participants. And then a, a lo locating like a central problem of the sexual revolution, not so much in the Cuban state's tendency to like subsume citizens under its aegis, which is what it does and what states do, but in its in its ignorance, not ignorance, but it's, it's uh, um, lack of discourse around race and racism, uh, which is continuous with the way the Cuban government has dealt with race since, um, you know, since, well, time immemorial. So I won't say much more about the project as it stands. I think that's enough. The only thing I, well, I'll say that, you know, so this was, a, this was more or less was my, uh, was the conference paper last year at SEM. Um, and I think that shows in some in some ways, although I've now sort of teased out the, it doesn't say things like in the video I just showed. Um, <laughs> but, um, oh, right. It will become, so very shortly, it will become a, a, a chapter in an edited collection on queer nightlife that's mostly uh, uh, 
edited by performance studies scholars. So that's where this is like immediately going, and, I'm, and I would be really curious to know what folks think about how I, this, how I should go about cha changing this from you know mostly a conference presentation that, that that this is basically what it resembles to now this still short chapter in, a, in an edited collection on queer nightlife in the context of performance studies. And then, but of course, this is also really some preliminary thinking about my dissertation project, which I'll start fieldwork for in May, long term fieldwork. So I totally welcome comments about um, the way that I'm thinking about this material in general and how I might go forward as I go into the field, and really anything else. So thank you all. Okay, <laughs> um, with your chapter, we received a short description, basically what you just okay. now that it's part of a book. So I, I made my comments, and I read very much trying to help you with, with this specific uh, thing that you're trying to do, which is <coughs> turn this fieldwork into a chapter in a book that is not about Cuba. Right. It's about queer nightlife. Um, so uh, the ethnographic work you did <coughs> with the drag kings I love. I thought is is very detailed, it's very nuanced, um, it's very rich, um, and I think it, it fills a gap. Just the fact that you're focusing on drag kings and not drag queens, I think is very welcome. <coughs> and there's the, 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 especially that anecdote with your brother is gorgeous. It's <laughs> full of meaning, um, transnational meaning about the north and the south. It's, uh, so. So basically, I love all that part. I don't have that many comments about that part because I feel it's, uh, I, I get a sense of uh, that I'm there, that, that there's more, things are more complex than what the CNSX is doing or anything that the government may be trying to do. Where, where I wasn't, I, I guess, where I would ask you to rethink is the introduction and by, and by extension the conclusion. I feel that your introduction is not quite related to what you, what you get at to with the um, field work. In the introduction, you talk about the sexual revolution. But don't, as you acknowledge now, you don't say almost anything about it. And in a country that has such a history of homophobia and, and repressive attitudes towards queer people, um, and in a book that is not about Cuba, if that's going to be your focus, you need to flesh that out a lot more. And also, in the conclusion, I would expect you to engage more explicitly how do these drag kings feel or get them perhaps bring out from your notes something that connects more directly to the issue of the sexual revolution, which you don't do in the chapter as it is. Um, oh, the, um, and the other, so in the introduction, you talk about the sexual revolution and the senesex as a or thing that you will, that you will have them dialogue against, and then the sentence doesn't come up until the last two paragraphs. So basically, you're saying you're going to do something, and then you do something. <laughs> um, but I think that it's an easy fix. I think you need just more distance, reread the um, the ethnography, and think what am I really doing here? And I think the nice thing about the collections is that you have the freedom to just present that ethnography. Um, it's short, you don't have to make such amazing claims. Maybe you can leave that stuff for your dissertation um, and present more questions, I think, than conclusions, perhaps, if these drag kings don't address the sexual revolution so explicitly, it doesn't matter. Just leave it open. <coughs> the beauty about it in the collections that they already invited you. <laughs> <laughs> now you can put this in writing. Um, I also wanted to praise your discussion of race, because I think it's also, um, not only you make explicit that this hasn't been discussed, but uh, your ethnography shows how these things persistently come up the, the mulata, the, 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 the queens uh, and kings yes. are often racialized as other. So that is all great stuff um, and very promising. And I look forward to seeing more of where this is going. And hopefully we can talk later about your larger project, because I don't know exactly where, what your yeah. dissertation project is. Thank you for that. That's all super helpful, and and I don't have much to say in response because I think that's that's it's super on point, and and yeah, the language I think in the 
you know, I really wrote the sort of the ethnographic part. Uh, <coughs> of course, wrote that, and that's what that's what I decided. I wanted the the, the conference presentation to be, and then the, the the outside of it is really more the theorization and, and thinking that went into writing, you know, grand proposals and, and my perspectives, right? So it, it's like linking those two, but not really linking those two. So I, I really appreciate that, and I will think more about what the what the more like local claims I'm trying to make in this small project are. Yeah, well, many, many of the things that, that Daniel already said, I, I completely agree with, uh, especially the, uh, you know, the, the value of what you're doing, uh, really, really interesting work, uh, that filling a gap. Um, but I would see a problem in the, in, the, in the paper itself, which is basically that, yeah, what Daniel was saying, you're saying one thing at the beginning and then you're doing something else. Um, so maybe I'll just do it by hand here. And then. So in the actual uh, discussion of these uh, uh, case studies and these uh, performance, particular performances, so you can basically uh, interpret these then as not only as local critiques to racial and gender stereotypes that have been pervasive in the Cuban imagination, um, especially the fear of the, the, the mulatto, mm -hmm. which has been difficult to record, but also as uh, uh, commentaries on contemporary developments um, of American and Cuban relations. So my comments go in two directions. First, I will address some of my concerns and uh, provide some suggestions regarding the larger project uh, and its general direction. And second, I'm aware that you requested these comments to you know, downsize the, the, the paper. So <coughs> ambiguity and ambivalence are central aspects uh, of the processes described in this paper. From the uh, micro level of the drag performances to the uh, micro level to the macro level of the institutional affiliations and sharing of political agenda, um, uh, which right now the paper are not really connected. So, however, so far the project seems to be almost exclusively about the ethnography, uh, the paper, uh, and uh, in addressing this lack of theorization, I would like to suggest we take one of the most salient everyday experiences of, of ambiguity in Cuba the existence of these two parallel economies as a metaphor for the processes taking place here. So in other words, would it be possible to theorize um, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, the theory vanished. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, no, it's not possible. <laughs> 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 and drag performances in terms of convertibility mm -hmm. using currency economy as a metaphor of translation. In my opinion, this may be a rich space for the exploration of, of drag as convertible, mm -hmm. uh, or as a convertible opportunity, as long as it emphasizes the emphasis remains on, on the ambiguity of, the, of these spaces and what, what this ambiguity allows. Mm -hmm. Uh, in other words, avoid falling in the trap of value judgment that may favor one capital adventure over the other. Uh, and well, instead of, on the economy of everyday practices of ambiguity. Uh, so for example, the idea that one's quality of life in Cuba depends on one's access to the tourist sector of the economy almost begs to be analyzed in light of the, in, in light of the dual currency as a metaphor. Um, another instance may be the general uh, ambivalence between the goals of the individuals that you focus on here and what you don't do, which is the role in the same from the state sponsor institution they belong to. Uh, here you may want to explore this ambiguity and ambivalence of navigating these networks and accessing both underground and sanctioned space. You know, that the, the belonging to this sort of two worlds allow them these individuals to do. Um, some of, one of the aspects that I'm missing from the essay is a more detailed account of what happens in these performances. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you want to actually do that. Maybe you don't want to do it for the, for the actual uh, uh, article. But at some point, you know, yeah, sure. more description of what happens. Um, so I have a feeling that sometimes these details sort of dilute into just um, expressions of what you want to read. You know? <laughs> um, so my question is, what else is there? Uh, what are the larger uh, performative articulations that these performatic experiences um, uh, allow? Is it possible to measure them beyond the subjectivity of the author as a uh, textual reading? Um, so in relation to this, I mean, an effort to emphasize uh, the transnational flows that uh, we want to explore in this workshop, I would also like to ask about the reception of these performances beyond Cuba. Mm. Um, so you mentioned that a little bit, um, uh, um, but how are these performances being noticed in the United States? Mm -hmm. 
but there really any formal or informal academic or commercial networks that allow these performance performances to transcend their in, uh, in current uh, ephemerality mm -hmm. and reverberate transnationally? Uh, or does this happen solely through the gaze of the author? Okay. And finally, my suggestion to shorten this article for this published version may be to refocus the argument uh, on the individual. So a little bit of what Daniel was saying, you know, and, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, um, I mean, think about the larger thing, the larger uh, interrelation of this individual with the institutions mm -hmm. for a later. That's, thank you. That's all super helpful. Um, I just yeah, I want to just say a couple. Yeah, the, that this I'm going to think a lot more about this question of the two economies as a metaphor because that's yeah that's something I found myself like losing a lot of space. And I think I'll leave, leave it this way. But you know, it's like, it takes a lot of space in the paper just to explain it yeah. because it is a bizarre situation that a lot of people don't know is, exists right outside of Cuba, and Cubans and Cuban studies. So anyway, that, that, so this, and, and so I, want, I should actually make use of the fact that I, it will take some time to explain it uh, through that. I've been thinking so much about, because the transformar, transformismo, like that, like that like word connection in that, like Mariela and the discourse of Senesex, it's transformar el mundo, vamos a transformar el mundo, and the way of transformando el mundo is through transformismo, right? And or rather, it's like this, it's this tool that's constantly used, and, I, and I've been sort of stuck on that and thinking about the word transformismo, and I think I've missed some other, this is an, this is an interesting thing, but I have a metaphor to be, to be thinking about the, the, the convertibility, the convertible, peso convertible. The only, the only thing I wanted to say was that um, one thing that I, and so I'm, I'm struggling with, with, especially in this context of this transnational music museum, just, uh, workshop. I'm, one thing I've been struggling with is precisely transnationalism. I'm very interested in the questions of like hemispheric blackness um, and the fact that there's a way that that uh, you know this these types of performances, particularly in drag king form, emerges in the Americas in working class communities of color. And 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 I'm interested in those questions. I'm I'm, I'm resisting and not so much in this paper, which then it comes out quite a bit actually. But in general, on the project, in the project, I'm kind of resisting the impulse to talk about the United States, which I feel ambivalent about because one, like so, in terms of the transnational flows of these things, you know, one of the things that's, of course, like there's a lot of immigration. There are a lot of drag queens in Miami, particularly queens in Miami, who um, who were performing in Cuba, came from Cuba, and also in Madrid, and they, you know, they're going out. What's happening now that's super fascinating that I don't think. I kind of don't want to write about, but except in the privacy of my diary, probably, but it is that like U.S.-based drag performers are going, most drag queens really, are going to Cuba and performing. And then mainstream Euro-American presses are writing articles like, ugh, U.S. drag queens show the Cubans what drag performances, oh, those poor backward Cubans, you know. So, and that's already happening. And it's like, you know, the doors opened yesterday. So it's fascinating to me. And so that, anyway, that's been really interesting. But I'm still thinking through how how to address that in a way that, that still like still considers sort of Cuba on its own terms or whatever that means. But thank you. I had a further thing that was inspired by something Alejandro said about describing more the, the event. Mm -hmm. You have you have only one moment uh, when you describe in more detail how they smile at uh, Horacio or Trump. Uh, is it Orquidia? Orquidia, yeah. Orquidia. Um, that, uh, I appreciate when you refer to the music that they were lip syncing, but I, in a way I wanted to know more why those choices. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking now that there's David Bisbal, who's Spanish, <laughs> and very fair skin, kind of blondish, yeah. and some by four, who are I think all their quartet, but I think they're all very fair skin. Is there a consistency there? Is the music that has to do with aspiration or some? Per why perform to that music? Um, and if there's, yeah, something that could be said about the music that is the, the choices they make for performance, I think there could be something there. Have you thought about the repertoire? Yeah, I mean, a, a, let's like I think that will wind up being um, a, a larger question when I go back into the field, like a, about how these choices, how these choices happen, right? I think w with the, the musical bit for me has been, and it's interesting you point out like that in this context, 
I have to think about that more. I mean, I think there's this whole, this, it's this, I guess I've been focusing on two things. One is the performance of masculinity and this sort of like, these sort of romantic ballads as being productive for the performance of sort of heteronormativity and heterosexuality. And then I've been focusing on the way that while race is obscured, actually there's tons of aphrodisphoric sounds animating all this. And that those have been sort of the ways I've been thinking about music. But less about like how do, how do they make these choices and why? And that's certainly a, a, like a major question in the dissertation um, that doesn't exist in the main era. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, I have to think, because you're totally right. I mean, yeah, like, these violets, like, yeah, I mean, and like Spanish, which figures in like a particular way in Cuba, um, in that, like, both, of course, within like the racial, like, racial imaginary, but also in the sense that, you know, Cubans, there was a time when Cubans could, when the, the number of Cubans who could apply for Spanish citizenship increased quite a bit. So a lot of Cubans have. Uh, uh, dual citizenship of Spain, and that's that's a that's a real currency for getting out. And so there's anyway, there's yeah that 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 particular flow is really meaningful. It could connect to the idea of currency, and yeah, connecting to the, to the mig migrants in Madrid. It's interesting. That's a really actually yeah, cause, and that's a bigger because there are uh, there are like there are many way, like the drag queens use a lot of Spanish music, and that to me is less surprising, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is this sort of like that that like reaching to that sort of like. Ideal of beauty. Ideal of beauty and the torch song, you know. You know yeah. But but um, but I hadn't thought I hadn't thought so much about Spain actually. That's and now I'm realizing that there's a lot. The dual ball and also, right? The and, yeah. So yeah, but they perform to this and this yeah, Yudu um, and so that's like my you know my, uh, I my, like part of my argument is that in this like while there while there's this clear value in the drag queen performances. On like lightening the skin and per performing a particular sort of beauty, that actually it's, there's tons of like African American Afri and Afrodite's work music happening, and then here in the drag king performance, yeah, like the you know they dwell on these they dwell on these uh, Afro Cuban genres, right? Like like uh, uh, Faustino Ramas and, they, and then and then the the um, and, and 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 even and that happens too in the drag queen performances. Um, so I saw your SEM paper and it was great. <laughs> <laughs> the video is awesome at that moment also. <laughs> but I like, but your verbal description was, I mean, it, it, it was really evocative Thank too. You. So I thought that was um, another perf a performance that is the speech are in the paper. And um, I, one thing that I that caught my eye that hasn't been mentioned yet is um, you talk about um, examining the quotidian yeah. and um, that your travel, like traveling to Patarga and picking your friend's girlfriend up at the bakery when she's late. And these are so, I spend a lot of time in Cuba too, and, yeah. and <laughs> this is totally such evocative descriptions, even just like they don't take a lot of time, but they're just really pointed about a lot of, um, about what life is like there, I think. And I think they would be that way for people who haven't been there too, so yeah. I think that you, that's a good, that's works well um, and I guess I wanted to know like what you're getting what more you're getting from them like what you how does the quotidian perform, uh, connect to their performances or what it, is that what's the next step there yeah any, anyone feel free to take that. <laughs> uh, no I, yeah I, I'm st I, I'm still that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. I mean I'm, in a way like locally in this in this project like what I'm trying to um, point to is just how, well, I'm trying to not isolate, of course, their performance event, right? And it's like, if if the, what winds up happening is that the the drag queen performance gets sort of plucked out by Sandy Sex, like these particular performers who are very successful get plucked out by Sandy Sex, in this like kind of tacit approval then of the, like, of the tourism economy, or the tourist economy, right? Um, which is like not surprising given that the state like is making that happen. Um, but that sort of contradicts some of the, some of the like, discourse of sovereignty that's really foregrounded in the sexual revolution. So then, if if, if that if that contextual bit like sort of puts, that for me more generally in dialogue with like the larger political economy, then in this case it's like the the lack of mobility, the lack of access to that sector on uh, as part of these women. Like that's why they're working at the bakery. Like they want to work in particular. They don't want to work at the bakery. They want to go to Havana and go to these semi-sex events, but it's a drag. Like, 
<laughs> that was <awesome. laughs> yeah, okay. We should stop now. Um, that, um, it, and, and it's hard for them to get around. But 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 I but there's but there's another part to your question. It's like like yeah, that I, there's there's a, like a line that I'm not drawing as clearly that I am still thinking through. Yeah. But I think yeah, even what you said just now, like pushing that out a little more, like cool. just highlighting like yeah, the distance and the, the difficulty of of of, of tra traversing that distance. Like it's much easier for you to do that. Like five poop is a lot less for you than I mean you say that but I <coughs> like you've been developing that a little more. Yeah, a friend of mine said that the other day. I, it was like, you know, a historian who was, I think, just angry that, like, I'm present at all in this. He was like, you know, you, why does it matter that you, that you spent that money? Like, what? And I'm like, no, the point is that, like, it's not the point isn't that I'm special and I spent the money and I'm so cool and it was whatever. Like, the point is that, like, m my friends would also have a hard time getting there and they wouldn't have five say say on them, right? And, yeah. like, and I've, I've been, I've, like, been, me I've met them times when they're trying to get there. So, yeah, yeah thank you for that. But, but you're right that there's a way to more clearly articulate that. No, he has more comments because we can take math. Thank you. Right. Here's Cian. Um, thanks, Felipe. Thanks for announcing us here. Thanks to everyone for being here, those of you who traveled. Thanks to Chelsea and Daniel for agreeing to respond to my so-called paper. And also to Alejandro for um, teaching such a lovely seminar in the fall that was kind of the germ for um, many of the ideas around this table. Um, and also thank you for permitting an Africanist in your midst. Uh, <laughs> in your midst a thoroughly, um, yeah, a thoroughly Hispanic Latino situation. Um, gracias. Um, so, <laughs> I wanted to, I'm just going to frame things just a little bit. Um, I should point out, in spite of the fact that I've been going to Malawi for the better part of a decade, um, this is a very new project for me. This, as I made clear in the um, introduction to the paper, this is a first pass of ethnographic materials that were collected um, recently, last summer. And initially, my interest has been, and my interest in the former project, the one um, after which this one follows, was looking at um, volunteer tourists, mostly American and Canadians, who go to Malawi for short periods of time um, and worked with an HIV and AIDS education um, non governmental organization working in rural primary schools. And so I was initially drawn to this Music Crossroads organization. Um, because of the presence of volunteer teachers from uh, Norway, Brazil, and Mozambique, and they're one of the kind of collectivities that I try and address in what I've written here. Um, but increasingly, I'm finding myself drawn to not just the motivations and interests and ambiguities of individuals, but also kind of what this organization does as an institution and institutional politics and the issues of funding and transnationalism incumbent on, um, on this particular organization. Um, and thus, it seemed like a relatively easy fit within the context of the seminar, which talked a lot about transnationalism and um, kind of contested ideas about what the nation is, what, what the nation, what does and doesn't stop at national borders, this kind of thing. So that's why um, I, I thought that these materials could be fruitful in this context. Um, in terms of where I see it moving in the next wee bit, I'm not, um, I'm a second year student, so I'm still a year or so away from pitching a dissertation topic, but I'm, one of the things I'm working through right now is, um, do I think about volunteering and kind of musical ramifications of international aid generally in Malawi, or do I um, think more about focusing in on one organization um, and maybe looking, I know it's far too early to think chapter by chapter, but instead thinking of um, different kind of outreach initiatives of a single organization as different nodes around which this network operates, as opposed to looking at different organizations that each have a, um, a volunteer aspect to it. So volunteers coming to different different parts of Malawi working with different groups. So that's, that's one thing that I'm kind of working through in this paper a bit too. Um, so I'll, I don't know what you've written, but I'll anticipate some of your um, criticisms. Also, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that, I'm aware of the fact that this is, um, 
this is the last paper before the break, and so we, I'm totally open to like a longer break period, or maybe you're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> you want to sink your teeth into some like easy kind of raw meat before uh, before the break. So feel free to kind of go hog wild when uh, when it is you offer your um, your teeth or your thoughts. But um, so one thing that I'm 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 really interested in doing a better job of is fleshing out some of the theoretical concepts I'm dancing around but not entirely engaging with. So, and this was kind of an outgrowth of the course, is that we talked a lot about modernity, we talked a lot about many modernities, underside of modernity, flip side of modernity, both you know, theory from the South, modernity from the South, all these different things. And I was so confused and kind of um, drawn in so many different directions that I realized from reading this paper this morning that I don't really do a good job of saying exactly what I mean by modernity. So that's one thing that I like to do. And then the other part of that is the work that neoliberalism is doing in this paper. What does that mean? Are we talking economic neoliberalism, cultural neoliberalism, um, neoliberalism, neoliberalism as it's understood in African context, Malawian context, etc. So the, that's another. These two, um, <coughs> these two theoretical concepts that I kind of dance around that need to engage a little bit more um, fully, a lot more fully, should I say? Um, I'm also. I've been recently thinking about um, the notion of these kind of large conceptual metaphors that pop up, especially in Africa's Africanist um, work. I mean, we had a job talk a couple days ago that talked a lot about um, compression as something kind of inherent in the music, but then also we can draw out from it and make these like, larger social and cultural points about what compression is in a context that's not necessarily understood in the music. This is something, of course, that happens um, in, when you talk about improvisation, this is another kind of metaphor that gets used a lot. There's an improvisation in music, but then there's also improvisation on a larger inter, interpersonal scale. Um, hotness, Lindsay and I have been talking a lot about hotness recently, and hotness is something that you hear about um, in the context of African discourses, but then also it's this organizing principle for um, a, a difficult and vexed history about musicology. So one metaphor I'm thinking about in relation to these materials is this idea of a crossroads, right? It's, a, it's inherent in the name of this organization. Um, I'd like to play with the idea of thinking about, okay, here's a name that people identify with and it was chosen for a specific reason, but then there's also the idea of a crossroads as a more social, political um, field through which people pass and in, in which people interact. Um, so maybe we could have a little bit of a discussion about metaphors and are they too totalizing, are they too small, are we doing too much work as fancy ethnographers or analysts and really it's not that relevant for the people who we're describing. Um, let me think, what else? Yeah, in addition to this, to these theoretical questions or to the kind of lack of theory going on here, um, one advantage I have as being a relatively junior member of this body is that I can also think about based on um, critiques or suggestions you have, how I could also shape methodology moving forward. And I mean that in terms of, I'm thinking specifically about Gilbert methodology, the kinds of conversations that I could be having that don't come through in this paper, um, the degree to which I should or shouldn't engage with music itself, which is like a bugaboo for a lot of us. Um, and uh, yeah, so those are the things that come to mind. Um, also, I mean, I have a, um, I, sometimes oscillate back and forth between feeling drawn to the idea of engaging with visitors to Malawi and kind of interrogating them ethnographically because I find that that's one um, interesting side of the story that doesn't get always get addressed when talking about African music. Um, and it also has a, you have a cool kind of corollary to, oh, there are these, you know, mostly white people coming to Malawi and engaging with musical practices or inventing musical practices where there were none before. That's kind of like what we're doing is a pop when we come to Malawi. So there's like a kind of cute thing going on there. But I also am mindful of the fact that if I, if I continue entering these ethnographic contexts and engaging so much with fellow foreigners or fellow outsiders, is what's getting missed in the mix here. Actual local practices, actual conversations with Malawians, um, and the people about them were all allegedly, you know, there, um, or for whom we're all allegedly there in some vexed and complicated way. Um, I've spoken for eight minutes and seven seconds. I can't think of anything else to say, but I'm really looking forward to what anyone has to say. If you haven't read the paper, um, you can also mention something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm more than welcome to hear um, any. You can find yourself on the bullshit scale on either end of things. <laughs> Uh, 
I can go first. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll tell you later why. So I did read your chapter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I read it thoroughly. I have to say, it wasn't easy to read. Okay? And it wasn't the writing. I thought your writing is great. It's very polished, it was very clear, no problems there. I had a very hard time, and you might hate me for this, uh, but I think I'm here from so far away that I can say whatever. <laughs> um, that I, I couldn't get into the music crossroads as an object of study. Um, and I don't know if, if maybe as an object of study is not that interesting, and or if it is interesting, if maybe you haven't found a way of really fleshing out the things that are there. Because you, you describe it and you say, this is a very interesting network of these agents, and it's sophisticated and it's layered. But then I kept reading and, and I couldn't find that. So honestly, I can't tell if it's the place. Mm. Or, and, and we would have to talk more about that to find that out. Because part of me felt like, why don't you study something else? Especially at this early stage, um, um, uh, it seemed to me like like a sort of failing or quasi-failing NGO. Like uh, there are so many in the third world that try that are benign. Uh, they're not doing any damage, it seems. Um, but the people who go there, like you talk about, like how people visualize a different way of life, engaging with this towards the end of your paper. But in what ways exactly? It seemed that they weren't cheating anyone, the students who went um, felt they were getting something out of it, which it wasn't the, the marketing that they school promised, but they were okay with it, they seemed happy in the pictures. Um, but it didn't seem like that it was really transforming their lives in interesting ways. The volunteers also, I've, now that you mentioned that you've worked more on volunteers, I understand more. In your paper, I thought, who cares about the volunteers? Like, they seem to be doing like, cultural tourism. Mm -hmm. they, they, they made up a grant that they want to play music with the locals, but just to be there. But that seems like things that Europeans do on a regular basis. Um, with the volunteers, I thought that maybe one way to get more out of it would be to look at how do they are agents of change there, even if they're not planning to do that. Like how, when they jam, even when they jam casually with the locals, like what music are they playing, what are they passing along? Um, the way you presented them seemed to me to be very sort of distant, and then you have one picture of them, like arms crossed, looking at, at the locals mm -hmm. cooking, that's how I felt they were portrayed, sort of like distant and not very engaged. And if they weren't that, then I guess who cares really about them? That's how I felt. Um, the, the person that struck to me that I felt I want to know more about is this guy, Dani Kalima. Mm. That you mentioned very briefly at the end, who's a Malawi and guy who's an ex-student of that school, who goes to Amsterdam? Amsterdam, and ends up winning uh, the Voice, or mm. uh, and I thought, oh, this is somebody I would like to know more about because it's this is somebody who used the school in some way or maybe not, mm -hmm. and then there's a transnational component. Um, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like no. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, keep, I keep blaming myself when you're reading something like this. I thought I'm a Latin Americanist. Maybe I don't know enough about mm -hmm. Malawian history. And but but uh, I don't know. I feel like you have to think that you have obviously people who study Malawi will be into your work because no matter what we do, people care about that specificity. But you want to speak to the broader ethno community mm -hmm. and. And I don't know, I was thinking about Luis Mench's work, the work where even if you're not interested about South Africa, the work in the studio is interesting to any person who is interested in the recording of world music, or um, 
to Reno with cosmopolitanism, and then became Thomas Mufuno, who's a f fairly famous pe person. Like, even though we're scholars, I, I don't think our stuff, I think we need to try to engage and make the work sort of like attractive, even for people who, who may not be in the area. Mm -hmm. And the music crossroads didn't do it for me. Mm -hmm. As subject. Okay. <laughs> uh huh. I don't, I don't think I made any... Maybe, yeah, maybe I can, because some of my questions sort of relate to similar issues, so maybe you sure, sure. can go that way. Um, can uh, yeah, yeah uh, so um, I have, there are some smaller things that I will just send to, to you just as little changes, but okay. um, uh, the, the, as neither an ethnomusicologist nor an Africanist, um, I don't have good points of contact for you on either count. Um, however, I wonder if, to the larger point of bringing in a broader interest and dialogue, if uh, sort of more uh, a, a broader contextual frame might help. So, for example, voluntourism is something that there's a fair bit of dialogue about already. Right? There's a fair bit of scholarship on it, and I didn't, I didn't like sense that it was part of a conversation that's ongoing in a scholarly way in your paper. So maybe if there's a way to sort of bring in some of those other points of, of dialogue between, say, like environmental voluntourism and medical voluntourism, which it sounds like you've done some with medical. But um, similarly, uh, this question of, I, I think like the, 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 it begins with something like there's a long history starting with the late 19th century, and I thought, oh, it's like so much longer than that with this question of music civilizing power for others, right, coming from Europe. And as I said, because my point of contact is Latin America, you can see it in the 16th century, right? Mm -hmm. So thinking about um, the civilizing power of music from you know European expansionists and missionaries as being a much broader and longer frame topic mm -hmm. um, that allows you to reach outside of Africa, but then could you could bring in the particularities of your situation and, and it becomes part of a conversation that is uh, speaks to more people than maybe the current, which feels so specific that we can't we can't see its connection. So for example, and I, I, this is gonna sound like a tired metaphor, because it's been talked about a lot in the last five or six years, but like for example, El Sistema, which has this idea of commodification and export of Western genre trained musicians and still has this exotic flavor to it, right? And kind of what that means for when they send out their sort of star students or their seas or whatever. These kind of um, conversations that might allow you to sort of speak more to others across. Mm -hmm. that's it. And maybe I'll just stop there. Okay, let me just finish right Wait, is why you're typing that? Oh, there's one other thing which is that um, I wanted to see a little bit more of you in there. So, for example, when you said at the beginning, like, oh, it's kind of like what we do. Like, it's a lot like what we do, right? Like when you say white people going into uh -huh. brown spaces and 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 looking at them and reporting on them and and and, and all that. That I felt like I wanted to see more of your positionality in the paper. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so, thank you, both of you. Um, I have a few ideas about how we might, in the significant time we have remaining, talk maybe as a group about some of these issues. Um, though, if, I don't know if anyone else has read it, and you're more than happy to offer your comments if you have or have not. Um, one thing that you said in terms of making, not making a case for um, this as an object of study in terms of contextualizing it more broadly in these, in these extant discourses that um, I would like to do in subsequent kind of incarnations of this work, if it continues. Um, so not so much thinking about putting it in a, in a larger context in terms of the world or in terms of the literature, but, but more this idea of looking at these kind of um, everyday kind of ordinary occurrences versus the more spectacular uh, international travel like Afro pop musicians or you know reality TV stars or singing competitions that appear in Europe. I, one of the things that's coming through in your comments is um, if you, if what I'm if what I'm writing about is coming across as boring, 
or uninteresting, um, then yeah, clearly I need to make a better, if, if I'm convicted about it, I need to make a better case about that. But it's also thinking about how to portray everydayness or um, ordinariness or boring boredom, we could say. Um, and whether A, that's a worthwhile endeavor, and B, if it is, whether it's, it's possible to do in a compelling way. I don't know if that's thinking about it in a more theoretically complex way. I don't know if it's getting more experimental ethnographically in terms of how I'm representing some of these people in their stories. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitant off, I just, as a kind of gag reflex to portray, to, to pursue the kind of international person gone abroad who, um, who does well in the voice and employs strategic essentialism and has, you know, the star rises and then quickly fades. Because I feel like that's the um, story of success that this organization is, is trying to tell. Um, and it's, that's where the organization hangs its hat in terms of achieving successful funding applications from international organizations. But rather, um, but focusing on the everyday or kind of ordinary folks or those people who might get caught up in the, as you characterize it, the kind of failure or the quasi-unsuccessful nature of this NGO, thinking more about how those people are affected and those people kind of make their way in the world or make their way in the context of this organization, what it does or doesn't do very well. Um, so that's something I need to think about, not just what I um, can do to make this more compelling, but also if I want to do it, or or if I want to put this group in conversation with other other groups, or if I want to yeah, if I want to put this group of volunteers in conversation with other groups of volunteers at other organizations. Um, but one idea I had in terms of opening this up to more folks is because this is a kind of an early thing, and because and it sounds like I'm hedging on my bets and trying to say, oh, it's not very good, but it's because it's an early thing. No, that's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, like, how do we collectively, as students and as faculty, think about approaching a project in its early stages? And how might, maybe as a group, we could think collectively about, um, you know, if something lights your fire, do you, how, how do you approach it? Do you write thin little vignettes? Do you, like, go in it, go at it from a more, structural, theoretical, literature review approach first. I'm just wondering if this were, let's say, for the purpose of the argument, this is something I were excited to pursue moving forward. What are some strategies? What are some things that would be um, viable kind of pathways? What's worked for people? So we don't have to talk about that now. I thought people had specific thoughts on the paper, but it's also fine if they don't. I'll, I'll just address that general question. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, uh, there are some scholars who work best in determining, in figuring out uh, what the kind of contribution argument is of a particular topic uh, in dialogue with others. And then, then there are some who, for whom it's better not to be in dialogue with others early on. And so, so I think it's partly a personality stage, a personality issue to figure out whether you work best bouncing ideas off of other people early on. That's how I tend to work personally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which then can help you to get a sense of what are, um, you know, what, what are the hooks <laughs> that the topic can potentially have. Um, or else, I can also speak to my husband who's also an academic. He actually works best by um, writing down his thoughts and being in intensive dialogue with written literature in the early stages, almost as though, you know, to be in, he's so introverted, to be in dialogue with someone in actual real life is almost too scary early, in the early, <laughs> in the earliest phases. Um, and then at a, at a certain point, you know, it's like he's, you know, he's, he's coming out of the cocoon and he can, you know, and so, so to, to get a sense of what your personality is and whether you get, whether you're energized by being in dialogue early on versus whether, whether it's better to be, you know, thinking through in dialogue with yourself, working with a lot of written texts. A suggestion related to that, I'm thinking, if you were to continue, I, I would suggest that you, you perhaps step back and think, okay, which of these stories is the one that I find the most compelling? Because yeah. I, I agree, like, I tend to work on more, more transnational pop stars, so probably it's my bias to push in that direction. Mm -hmm. But you do talk about this other guy, 
who who complained about I can't remember his name. Uh, who, the violin. And the yes, wanted to play the violin, but they didn't let him. And eventually, he's the one selected to go right. uh, to Norway. Mm -hmm. So he, he he potentially can be a very interesting, not a success story, but one that you could tell us more. But in what you have, you don't flesh it out enough to to. Like the only thing that I remember coming through is the fact that the tension between the violin and the rock instruments, and so he was a little bit feistier. But I, I couldn't get a lot more than that. So if you feel, I would, I almost feel inclined to suggest that just write about that and see where that takes you. And, and if it becomes a story worth telling, then build from there. Perhaps what happened now is that you had this early field work and you try to make it into a very cohesive. <coughs> Because your paper is very cohesive and, and, and it has an arc and it's like it's almost like a finished thing, but the fieldwork itself is not fleshed out yet. Mm -hmm. So maybe just don't try to have it that polished, but flesh out that and see where that takes you. Mm -hmm. It can take a long time to figure out why you're drawn to something. I think, and yeah. also and also often there there will be situations where you're drawn to something, and other people will tell you. Oh, that's that's that topic's an albatross, or oh, that's not you know mm -hmm. that's not going to have any currency in the discipline. But it, but it may take months. But it may take months or, or even a year for, for you to figure out why you were actually drawn to it. And there may be this aha mm -hmm. moment. But it, it takes intensive introspection and, and thought. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I think that's really productive. And and I mean, what I have found really kind of useful in the practical sense just to get into that aha moment is precisely via uh, of pursuing interlocutors. Yeah, so because I mean, because it's very easy to find oneself in, in isolation. I mean, they, there might be something interesting here, but, it, but it, yeah, but I'm not part or I'm not articulated enough with other people. And, but sometimes in, in order to pursue this connection, I mean, one needs to Look beyond the specific topic. So, so I mean, so what I'm trying to say is that there is there are multiple networks to which you may be affiliated. I mean, I mean, the Africanists are just one of those. Malawi is just one of of of. It's just another possible connection. But there are some other networks that are not necessarily a topical or in terms of the the specific uh, topic situation. Not even music. So, for what. Uh, by the general description of your project and, and their comments, there might be some very cool methodological connection. I mean, so I, I'm, I'm kind of really fresh with this bibliographic intense study for my exam of multi-sided ethnography. So as I was in musicology, but I was reading all these works in uh, by anthropologists doing all these multi-sided studies, kind of following these cases in multiple transnational scenarios. And, and yeah, so people thinking about multi-sided ethnography in terms of following the, the same discourse in various locales, for instance. And, and there's when one find, oh, this is where I have a narrative that I'm maybe sharing with some other people. So yeah, it's just to put in a few words, so def definitely kind of open up just to multiple areas of interactions, either methodologically, thematically, and once, and when you find these interlocutors, it's, I mean, it's that aha moment is part of saying, well, I have something to say, uh, in this conversation, and I will, yeah. So I, I may address this this specific narrative, challenging what these people have said or complimenting what they're saying, and just, I mean, like building that kind of sense of academic community beyond disciplines, beyond topics. I mean, yeah. I wanted to jump in and say that I really like the idea of a failed NGO and that like sort of yeah, un sort of whatever, un -trafficked. I don't know, just sort of like the backwater, not really known, not really exciting. Um, I like that kind of, um, I like that idea. I think what maybe, like what Danielle was saying, that um, there's the, there's a, it's a very smooth narrative and there's not a lot of really, there's not a lot of ethnography that draws you in to, the, to, the, to what you wrote. Um, so maybe that's part of, um, the, the challenge, I guess, or the, the, the difficulties with this, with the piece. Mm -hmm. um, I also, one of my questions for you was um, just more about why the volunteers, because I, my first reaction was very, like, this really, like, mm -hmm. yeah, don't write about the volunteers, like, um, not that we're here to tell you what to do for your project, but, um, 
just like, is there, I guess my question would be, is there like a radical or interesting or like challenging way that you could, if you do decide that those are the most interesting people or that's the most important story to tell, can you do it in a way that's not like heart of darkness or saving Africans or I don't know, mm -hmm. like what, or, or, or going on a, a long tour, mm -hmm. you know, is there like what, what kinds of, I don't know if you have thoughts about that now, like what, how you would write about them if you would or that you would share with us. Yeah, um, so cl yeah, clearly, thank you for those comments. Um, this, coming back to this idea of a failing or quasi-failing NGO, um, or just mundane, I guess not. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but 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 this is a thread that's come through, and it's not one that I necessarily. What I what I wanted to do was talk about ways the way that the NGOs marketed or self interested messaging is not an apt description for what's actually going on. But one of the ways in which that came through, it seems, is that it, it's failing or that it's. Um, that it's ineffective or ineffectual, this kind of thing. So it's always interesting to see what message or something you might be sending across when you don't intend to do. And I think that is one way that I can use this when re-entering the field or doing more field work to, to kind of tailor any questions that I'm asking. In terms of the volunteer thing, um, so my the project, the other project, of the project that's come to a close and that uh, about which I'm writing a uh, book chapter is it does a, it 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 takes on volunteers in a much more um, theoretically complex kind of fleshed out way and ties them to a history of uh, musical exploitation in this particular corner of the world um, and I think that I was wary in writing this to not to duplicate the same treatment of the same types of people because the la the conclusions I reached in the last project were had a lot to do with a specific group of individuals and there was an organization that I knew much better, it was an organization that I had a connection to over many years. Mm -hmm. And so I think maybe some of the um, remove with which I'm treating these folks is from a position of not wanting to um, not wanting to paint them with the brush I've inherited from this, this previous project. But maybe that's, yeah, maybe that's, I'm being a little too, um, I'm being a little too dear when it comes to that, and I should think more about, um, yeah, bringing, yeah, I, I'm thinking kind of in overdrive about, about your comments. The heart of darkness thing is obviously, um, or the opposite, like just critical. Like right. So that's what I was going to say. Is that it's very, it's it's easy, too easy, and thus tempting to write a um, kind of an adventure story kind of thing. But then it's also quite easy to swing all the way in the other direction and to, you know, unpack, problematize every action as a neo-colonial encounter or one that is purely extractive and all these things. And the, I mean, the truth it seems to me is somewhere in the middle, and it's about not quite the very middle, but it's about finding a compelling way to theorize and talk about that, um, but at the same time, not losing sight of the actual data and the actual, um, you know, the actual meat of what you've encountered, I suppose, during field work. Um, yeah, I, I think that, I think one of the things I will be doing, so this was, you know, I had 20 or so interviews from the summer, and this, I wrote this paper, as often happens in, coursework with having done like one or two, and tra having transcribed one or two of these interviews. And I'm sure at this point and in subsequent months when I've unpacked my materials more, there will be um, more compelling treatments of, of volunteers and their motivations that might form threads or coalesce around themes that would come through in a, come through better in a subsequent uh, version of, of what I've written. Um, there was something I wanted to say about this idea of like going around the table and thinking about ways to start a project, but I don't 
recommend for someone else. Just something that this yeah. is, so I, not having read this, um, I think on the, the bullshit spectrum, I'll probably have to skip this from what I'm hearing. This, there is something which is, I don't know about compelling, but there is something interesting about the register of the Monday. And this is something, you know, these people, well, I'm sure it's very important to, to, to go to Malawi to have this whole experience and they get there and sort of find themselves standing up with their arms crossed. There's something, there's something about that. Um, as far as like your process for getting at what that something is, for me, it's often just, you just keep writing it until you figure out what it is that you're talking about. Um, and accept the uncertainty for a while. You know, yeah. Find a comfort level with the fact that it will be uncertain. Mm -hmm. Or or even write towards that uncertainty, right. right? Not looking for the conclusion already, but look for exactly what it is either, I mean, often conflict or failure is useful. Absence is very hard to write towards, but but trying to write towards absence will get you to, to whatever the content of that absence is. Um, so I think, that, um, I think that there's something about um, there's there's something about the mundane which I think that some of the um, affect theorists have done stuff about that there's stuff about the suburbs and um, one thing that comes through it might be a very different register of boredom but I think it's in my cocaine museum housing has this great chapter about just boredom in this um, little rainforest town um, and so think right mm -hmm. right without the without the feeling of necessity to sort of close everything off but just write towards whatever doesn't make any sense or try and or even sort of address yourself and write and you don't have to put all in what the actual project is right mm -hmm. or what the product is right but just kind of use that as part of your process to figure out what it is there is something about the mundane uh, that i think can be um can become something that's more interesting to figure out what it is it's also critical literature on this stoop line. It's between the stupor and the sublime. <laughs> 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 it's it's not nice sure. everyday life. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Every, that's my Monday. <laughs> that's not the guy. Okay. Yeah. okay. I wanted to make a, um, I guess, a broader point for some. I'm noticing a tension between like my more negative statement of like wanting to drop this and the more and the more positive right. spin that you guys are trying to make. And I wonder. Uh, I, don't, I guess I'm, I'm a foreigner, so I'm, I'm thinking if I see these things differently. Um, you are a Harvard student, right? So I would imagine. Um, I went to Penn, so there was a little bit of that too. But I imagine that Harvard is worse or more, even more intense. That the sense that almost everything we think. It's to be superb. And if we kind of like, we'll, we'll go on on Friday and we listen to this song and we have some great thoughts, I should write a paper on that. <laughs> and, that and there's a pressure that every, every thing that we do has to become this mm. peer reviewed I mean, for musicality. And, and, and I feel that especially the beauty of being a second year is that, okay, you got this grant, you went, you tried it out. I think it, it's not the end of the world to say, but maybe. Um, I'm not going to do that, and I'm going to try something else. And I feel that that's not a failure. Like, um, there's a lot of scholars sometimes leave something because they maybe not be able to figure out what's the beauty or mm -hmm. why explain why they were attracted to that. They write the dissertation, and only their second group project is like, oh, that that's thing awesome. that I did. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I think too in the longer field work. A fair bit of that is going to feel like a failure, no matter what. <laughs> and so you you may not be able to squeeze something delicious out of every possible mm -hmm. moment that you have spent mm -hmm. doing field work, like working in archives too. Yeah, that's that's where my point of contact is. <laughs> like I remember in my dissertation, uh, it ended up being I think five chapters. I think I wrote seven, mm -hmm. and two I felt like they weren't going anywhere, and then one ended up being a published thing. In an edit collection. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not in your book, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a. Um, I don't really turn this into a group therapy session. More than I ever have. <laughs> but I think there is something to the 
alleged experimentalism of early graduate school. Um, that is, however, quite. And there's a there's quite a bit of. Um, I'm sure this is true across the board, but it's certainly true here that there's that is tempered by, you know, producing four, five, twenty, twenty-five page papers every semester. I mean, that's like a, you know, and then oh, Felipe needs a twenty to twenty-five page paper for this workshop that is coming together. Blah, you know, so that's one of these things gets put here, and then in some weird way, this around this table becomes a part of the teleology that you are deconstructing by saying it's okay to fail. It's like, well, I'm sort of sure, but I'm still here and I need to present something, and it only makes sense if I kind of put it in some, up. It, it, it makes the most sense and most legibility for folks here if it's a part of a, if it's a part of a trajectory towards whatever kind of professional credential that we're all here presumably and being paid to pursue. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, I think it cuts both ways. I think on the one hand, we get to explore a little bit, but sometimes it's forums like this that have many professional trappings in which we all lament the fact that we're all so professionally driven when in reality this, this too is feeding the beast. Right? So um, I don't know. I mean, it's something, to, it's something to think through. And I appreciate Felipe said many times, you know, a work's in progress, he said. Mm -hmm. He's an early, early stage chef, he said. Um, so like, <laughs> I'm, I, I, yeah, I was, I had a safe space to say that too. <laughs> and, I was thinking, and I was thinking that, yeah, I would, I would really kind of test the outer the outer boundary of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. So thanks for coming on this journey with me. That sounds summative. <laughs> I don't mean for it to yeah. under 11 minutes if people have more shit they want to pile on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and stop it. Um, I, one of my questions was about like what the music sounds like. I guess one of the things that I felt like was missing, um, you sort of brushed it off really quickly as it's just rock, because that's the easiest instruments for them. But I wanted to know what it sounded like. Like, what are they, what kind of rock are they playing? Like, do they sound good? Like, what? Um, the, I, I didn't look at the pictures because I was reading it on the bus over, and I just got to the end of the text and it was like, hey, I'm done, I'm done. Mm -hmm, sure. But um, the, the pictures look really great. The photos look, I don't know, they made me think about it in a totally different way. Um, and again, just going back to like a not in their graphic detail and mm -hmm. sonic detail. And so, I don't know if you want to talk about that right now. <laughs> um, I mean, it's something I'm still, so I went back in January and was more, um, was more committed to yeah making more kind of recordings of music and thinking about form and stuff like this. And also, kind of the collective composition and creation and rehearsal process among students at the school. Um, I don't have anything particularly trenchant to say about it at this point in time, but it is, that's helpful to hear that it came through, or its absence came through, because it would be, and reading your work, clearly you're the other. Yeah, so thank you for that, and um, that's something I'll look to attend to. What, the, the question that I wrote down, I think, maybe gets at some of these questions about like early stage work and thinking these things. And, and I and I feel that too. Like I, you know, I've uh, like this preliminary field work and could go into the field and do something really different, actually. Um, but I I was I was going to ask you if you could more clearly sort of articulate the stakes for you, yeah. right, in this project, and like what, like what are your politics? Like if I had to tell someone what you exactly what you think about this mm -hmm. after reading this paper, I wouldn't I wouldn't be so convinced that I know. Mm -hmm. Not that that's always our job, but like for me, that's like that's where every project starts. Like I, I feel like a tiny bit more clarity about why I'm doing any of this when I read like work in when I read like methodological methodological works in like critical ethnography, right? It's like like addressing like a particular political addressing a lived domain, right? And like making an intervention of some sort and like starting from a politics, right? And so that's like that's the only thing that I ever feel like I'm beholden to, right? Is like my politics about what I'm doing. Like I don't I'm not beholden to Harvard, that's for sure. Oh it's on camera. I'm not beholden <laughs> 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 Love Harvard, <laughs> um, but so that, that's like for me that's like a, that, that's the starting point, right? And then maybe you write the stickiest thing about that particular. It, it can be an, if it's an intervention you want to make or if it's an intervention you see being made. But anyway, that and then I think I think we so often, particularly here, because this was not the case at Michigan where I was, but like we avoid saying anything about what 
like I so I hear so many papers from my colleagues, and I'm like, what do you care about this? Like I'm very con I'm, that's mm -hmm. totally opaque to me. That's not true in this conference, which is nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, and that's not true for your paper either. It's not opaque to me what you think about it, but it's but I would I, I, I would want to. Yeah, well, and you're someone who who knows me personally, yeah. also knows has seen other things I've written, yeah. and so there's also that difference between. Yeah, you have a different you have more background and you draw a contrast. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, nobody else has any comments? I guess we can go for the coffee break. Yeah. And we're we'll coming at 3 30. Let's take care. The music of Colombia is like Pacific. There's a dinner afterwards, if you're all welcome to come. Uh, uh, that's a Badalus. Uh, yeah, pretty much it. So again, like the same format, brief presentation by the author, then discussion with the respondents. So my paper is about Doain, Orquesta Experimental de Instrumentos Nativos. Uh, it's a La Paz-based new music ensemble, and it's also a pedagogical program. Uh, I'm guessing also you didn't read the paper in its entirety. It was very long, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's just like listen a little bit of what it is. Ensemble. Uh, the conductor is Sergio Prudencio, who I discussed abundantly in my paper. Uh, OIN it was, it started like this uh, that, uh, as a, basically an orchestra of indigenous instruments that perform <coughs> new music, composed music. Uh, as it grew, it has also extended to a pedagogical program. As I speak, it had like 600 students attending the, the peripheries of La Paz and like, uh, students in it. They ascribe to a, to a discourse of decoloniality. Like what they're doing is a form of like a working against a colonial systems. Like they recognize modernity as being a, a colonial uh, arrangement. Uh, uh, they see education as an alienating thing. Uh, they see, uh, coming from indigenous movements, they see education as this imposition of the Spanish language, as this sort of uh, call for genocide, really, like the taking over from uh, modern ways of being, Western forms of education, and uh, urban ways uh, that cleans uh, indigenous practices. So they see this as a way to like uh, recover this, both the, the pedagogical program and the orchestra. Uh, and they have, like this discourse of the colonialism that they have had, has been very successful uh, in Latin America, right? Like many, many ensembles followed kind of their lead, 
Universidade das Artes em Ecuador, que está aqui. Has a ton of funding, and it's like this new arts university that's pretending to find a new way to uh, to work through you know music education that is informed by the locality. Has it's also been like you know, Sergio Prudencio was a central part of how this university was in the music program. Uh, so I decided to like to to them other words here. Okay, this is a colonial. How is the colonial? And in what ways is it advancing the colonial cause, indigenous movements, and those sort of things? So that's basically what my paper is about. Trying to problematize a little bit of that discourse, which I think is received too positive, uh, too optimistically by you yeah. in Latin America in general. Uh, because I'm like addressing this sort of optimism, sometimes it reads like very polemical, I think, right? Like, so I'm not very comfortable with the term comes out of, but like, you know, I'm just writing and oh my God, that's, you know, so that's something I, I've been trying to work on, how to like tone down this. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be like productive because the people here at uh, OIN, they are very receptive, they are very open to ideas and discussion. And I've talked about these things with them and like they, they are aware of the problems and trying to address them. So I think even though it's a polemical tone, it's something that they will be able to receive critically and just like, uh, yeah. Uh, so having said that, uh, for those of you who didn't read the paper, a bit. I'm doing some basic claims. Uh, so for example, the title of my paper is The Colonial Aesthetics, Letter Revolutions, which is kind of like trying to show that ambiguity of what's mm -hmm. trying to like make the colonization to ascribe into uh, this very, uh, you know, first like uh, new music as this sort of necessary form to decolonize when new music is something that is definitely from the from this historiograph historiographical, genealogical understanding of history, of music history, that comes from Europe, right? Uh, so, yeah, like, it's, uh, OIN, like, being, putting new music at the center, in a way, is kind of like, putting their indigenous uh, side, like, the indigenous tradition of <coughs> music side, trying to, to exploit and to advance, <coughs> put them as a sort of past, as a sort of, uh, uh, more like a, some, some sort of essence, some maybe essence, like the instruments are just like instruments that contain all the indigenous world. And what actually has agency, what is moving, is new music, right? So that's something I find a bit problematic and I'm trying to problematize that. Uh, also, <clears throat> I'm also talking, I, I, I went through a lot of work to try to show how Oin was born at the same time that uh, indigenous movements were born, especially the Catarista movement in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, so basically, these are moments that are, you know, after a big social revolution in the 1950s, uh, indigenous people, uh, they were given a little benefits by the state, like an agrarian reform that was very successful to place, educational campaigns that were trying to promote indigenous cause. But in reality, what ended up happening was a sort of like cleansing of indigenous forms of communal land ownership, uh, the cleansing of indigenous languages or attempted cleansing didn't really work that way. Uh, so like that led to this sort of class consciousness in terms of identity, right? Uh, peasants and working classes were uh, starting to understand themselves as indigenous peoples, right? And that in order to like advance their worldviews, they had to be, the state had to understand their indigeneity. And that's what they were trying to bring forward. Uh, Oin is born during this time, right? So, um, in a way, I see Oain as being this, uh, ascribing to the same discourse, claiming to <coughs> defend indigenous difference, but in reality, it's just like moving towards like a, to, it's a compositional project, that's what it is, right? It's a, it's a new music, contemporary music project that uh, promotes uh, the education of indigenous instruments, but that's about it, like, doesn't really move beyond a, a more material sort of engagement uh, in terms of like, you know, engaging indigenous musicians and bodies and warriors other than through the instruments, right? Uh, there's a, to give an example, like Sergio Prudencio, he has this article written in 1992, then kind of republished in 2008, where he talks about, uh, like, he says, like, education alienates. Education, like, makes us European. It's, like, not designed for us. And, and so, like, the people, that can actually bring about liberation from this alienation. It's just people that have been well educated, but that can that are also like smart enough not to fall into this sort of alienation, right? 
Uh, so he's certain, you know, he's talking like artists and philosophers and especially composers that create this new music and this new musical conscience can advance this liberatory cause. And for me, that's like quite problematic. It's kind of like, you know, making the composer this like mass liberator, right? Like and the new music composer especially, which is such a, new music is by definition alienating, right? It's like very foreign, it's very it's strange to, to, the, to the medium. So I, I, I was trying to work onto that. Now that being said, my criticisms were all through that, right? But I think all of those criticisms are come from a very close reading of texts mm -hmm. and what Sergio was writing. And I did a little bit of ethnographic work with them, which is what, like, I don't know, four or five hours hanging out with them and three pages of emails, that was it. <laughs> uh, but talking to them, uh, they do talk about this as a very liberatory, and I can see they mean it, right? Like, this is, they find this as a freeing way, like, most of the students here, they experience very authoritarian educational regimes. They experience a uh, cultural alienation and turns out I was finding a paper and I don't need to go through that. Uh, but they find this as a liberatory experience. They find this as a way in which they can engage people and understand why they have been victims of racism and they can understand these kind of things. So I think at a pedagogical level, uh, you know, in the humans that are like, being engaged with you, I mean, this is actually like a, a productive thing. The colonial, I'm understanding the coloniality here in a sort of like, negative politics in the going against the state-led uh, homogenizing uh, movements and also as a politics of care, so to say, of like caring about each other, about like understanding where racism comes to be, this, those sort of things. So I, I see like a, uh, that as an advancement. Uh, this idea of communal learning to indigenous experience, you can say that. Uh, yeah, there are other things and I have a few questions for you if we have more time at the end. Uh, a problem that I, I see from my project is that I'm too focused on this, is this the colonial or is not? And like, that's kind of like too narrow of a binary to like really see the struggle going behind this. Um, it, like, you know, there's also like, this is music and I'm not really discussing the music and that's for different reasons too. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I have a few questions. That, uh, a couple of things that probably we can discuss at the end if there's time. I'm seeing this as an interesting project that could uh, evolve into a dissertation. So like, maybe I want to hear like, your opinion if you think this as a productive way. Uh, also, do you think it would be convenient to show this to OIN and their members? Like, especially considering the polemical tone that I have, I don't want to like, create walls that could later attack me. Uh, and also, I had like, a couple of pages about like, my personal experience in one of the concerts. Instead of that, before I had a music analysis of, of a piece, right? And, but like every time I read analysis, I'm like, oh my god, analysis again. It's like, it kind of feels like analysis. Just, <laughs> <laughs> so, right? Every time I read analysis, it kind of feels like what the author is feeling through the music, just like being justified through musical structures. Right. So this was my kind of sort of a lazy attempt to like go against that. And uh, like, do you guys think that work? That's pretty much it. Right? I could I could start if you want. Um, so I, I I found this such an engaging read. It was a great read. Um, I, it, yeah, I was very excited. Um, I have um, a number of kind of open-ended comments and questions that fall under umbrellas. At first I started with three umbrellas, but now I have five umbrellas. <laughs> it's good that we're not talking about tomorrow because I do probably have even more umbrellas. The one is form. I'm really interested in the, in the, in the unusual form that this essay takes. Um, so this essay is written as a kind of montage with a series of different um, temporally disjunct moments that are used as points of entry to a kind of non-linear history um, of Bolivia. And so I'm interested in form, also uh, the question of literacy, which returns throughout this, this essay. Um, I also want to talk about post-colonialism uh, as a kind of disciplinary movement. And, um, and then also modernism slash avant-garde and then revolution. Um, so the, on the question of form, I thought that the montage form works really well. Um, and what I especially appreciated was the care with which you um, constructed the sequence of non, of temporally disjunct um, uh, episodes. Uh, and the way that you use, for example, um, the discussion of the 1980 coup, that precedes the discussion of 
1513 colonization. And so you're, through the narrative, you're enacting how, you know, you're enacting in some way the experience of, of how one trauma in 1980 um, opens up to this much deeper wound. Uh, and, and then once you're in the 1513 section, then you open up to your, your kind of theoretical ruminations. And so um, the response to this reiterative trauma is a search for a kind of theorization of the of the colonial um, situation, uh, drawing on you know you're obviously drawing on post-colonial literatures, but also you're thinking through you know uh, as your own you know as your own you know, in your own voice, and um, so I found that really compelling. So I just want to praise you on that point. Um, uh, one question I have is, what models are you using for, for, for this kind of montage construction? And are you thinking about it self-consciously as a form of literary or scholarly experimentation? Because it's also part of a, of a history of us that oh, like, there's a whole tradition to this kind of montage uh, writing of history and the use of uh, temporally disjunct fragments. And are you self-consciously linking up with that? And also, does that um, does that also have any relationship to your thinking about the experimentalism um, that is part of this aesthetic scene you're studying? So that's, that's another question. Um, and also another question connected with the form is um, this will affect you know what kind of um, publication uh, form form this could take. So you know it would be really difficult to get this accepted as a peer reviewed article um, if you keep that form, but it might become part of a, you know a, a chapter in a dissertation or possibly could enter a, a, um, an edited collection. OK, the question of literacy. Um, there's, so, so you describe the question of literacy versus non-literacy as um, mapping, onto a kind, uh, ma mapping onto the question of uh, the condition of the colonizers and the colonized. And literacy tends to map one-on-one -on -one with the colonizers and, and non-literacy with the colonized. But a lot of um, literature has been uh, questioning that kind of binary. And I don't, I'm, I'm not incredibly well versed in it, but I do know, for example, my colleague Christine Don, who works on music in Senegal, is working against the kind of um, uh, narrative of colonialism that's, that's always showing the you know, non-literate Africans or the or African oral cultures as, as having been you know, subordinated and oppressed by the literate European um, colonizers, and then also recently there was a talk by, uh, attended by Glenda Goodman where she was talking about Connecticut River Valley um, Native Americans in, um, in the 18th century and literacy practices. So, so I think it would be interesting to actually problematize that distinction some, and, and if you want to hold on to a strong divide between literate and the non-literate and map it on, in, into this kind of binary power relation in a strong way, make it clear why you want to hold on to it, and also answer those literatures that have been problematizing it. <coughs> Question of post-colonialism, you end the essay with a really strong claim, and <laughs> this is perhaps your most political moment. And it's kind of exciting, but it's also a little bit, you know, a little bit much. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> I think you should read it for the benefit of the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I'm just going to read the last few sentences. <laughs> so, so you're you're writing about um, these students who, in uh, what was the year 1980, react uh, in this very outraged, um, incensed way to a performance of you know this group, and they're shouting bourgeois and elitist and blue, and they're really upset. You're alluding to their horror at this performance, and you say perhaps what the students felt was prescient horror, the knowing that soon will fight for decolonization in a rarefied, lettered realm, one in which difference is fought through obscurantist neologisms, parentheses, Baba, Mignolo, et al. Semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> the fear of realizing that the fight for recognition of difference could be taken out of the streets and be uprooted to the rarefied realms of realm of high arts, lettered castration. Period. The end. So um, I, I like I like the fact that you're like laying your cards on the table. But, but some things to think about. Um, so first of all, there is this big question among this you know baby, basically like baby boomer generation of post-colonial theorists. They're wondering what is the legacy of post-colonial studies, and and, and and it's good that you're drawing, you're questioning that at the end. But I also want you to think even more about it and maybe 
if you're going to bring it up, really engage with it even more. Right. I, I, there were a few years ago, a few years ago I went to um, uh, this memorial um, conference for Edward Said in Utrecht. And the, the anxiety about what is the legacy of post-colonial theory, was it too obscurantist? Um, that anxiety permeated the whole cast of characters. And um, you know, this is like Robert J.C. Young is thinking about this, Bruce Robbins, they're all thinking about this. And so it's an important question, and I, I would just encourage you to, to actually um, use less of a blunt instrument in, in tackling it. Um, it, because also you're implying that you know different and different that, that the recognition of difference could be taken out of the streets and uprooted into the rarefied realm of high art. So it's almost as though saying with this with the you know formation of postcolonial studies um, in the 1980s that that somehow that took the fight out of the streets, and that's a major claim to make. Right. Mm -hmm. And so and so I would want you to think through. Okay, what did happen in the 80s? <coughs> Uh, and, 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 and there needs to be more texture in, in, in thinking through that. Um, and this also is linked up with the uh, also the question of literacy in a way, you know. And then um, and then finally, oh, the last two things. Okay, modernism and avant-garde heritage. Uh, you talk, you you um, draw out the question of um, or the theme of, you know modernist artistic production, production that draws on symbols of ethnicity or nationality and then um, brings them into some kind of, a, a kind of um, world of, um, a world of composition that is seen as advanced or modern and so you're kind of taking this abstract idea of what the ethnicity is and then you're, 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 you're putting it into a concert world uh, setting and a compositional approach to composition that um, is basically using the, the symbols of ethnicity and, and nationality as a kind of, um, you know, the flavor that is showing how this nation is distinct from other nations, but they're all in this modern world together with the same concert hall conventions and the same, you know, kind of advanced language of composition and all of that. And that's and that's linked up with um, with the founder of the program's own language. Um, but 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 this that there's this other question with modernism and avant-garde, um, uh, which comes through in a less prominent way, and that's the question of um, of emancipation, which you mentioned in your talk. The question of um, how you know if we call into question the basic categories of the arts, or like the basic question of what is music, is there a liberatory potential in and destabilizing those basic terms um, that undergird our art institutions and our you know thought about what it means to be human and what what it means to be civilized and all these this, and so there's a whole heritage of of, of, of modernist and avant-garde aesthetic practices and thought about these practices that is you know interested in how um, you know how uh, liberation can be brought about through critical thought linked up with these kinds of uns unsettling aesthetic practices. And so I think that theme can be foregrounded more because it's actually in tension in some ways with the um, with the other with the other stand of modernist thought. And then finally the question of revolution. Um, you have this you, you get you this this wonderful quotation um, turn of the sun, revolt and renovation of the world, the world before colonialism. Um, and so uh, recently in my seminar we were reading Hannah Arendt's On Revolution and one of the interesting aspects of that text is Arendt makes the point that um, the American, that the United States American Revolution and the French Revolution are often seen as these historical turning points that help to create this new way of thinking about history as as, temp as linear, as teleological, as you know, moving us into, the, uh, into a future of liberation and so on. Um, the kind of historical temporality that you're trying to move away from in your own narr narration of this history. And, but if you actually look at the history of the term revolution, revolution, when it was first applied in political context, meant restoration and meant moving back. It was taken from the world of astronomy, the idea of um, the revolution of the planets, you know, and, and revolving, circular, <laughs> And then it was brought into a political context, and first, she says the first time it was used was with the restoration of Charles II, and that, that even the American revolutionists in the colonies were trying to restore rights they thought had been taken away. And so it was all about restoration and revolving back. And so she's showing that the very etymology of this idea of revolution is actually much more complicated 
um, and doesn't fit with the, the teleological narrative history that she is actually trying to write against as well. So that's just an interesting, you know, sure. set of ideas that resonate in some ways. That, that's that that that's I'm done. I'm right. <laughs> 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 I'm really excited about that. Sorry. So just to respond now before going to the. Uh, Wow, okay, that was a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I guess talking about the conclusion, like, first of all, like, something I tried, 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 and just couldn't make it. I didn't want to have a conclusion. Right. Yeah. To, like, following this non theological narrative right. I was trying to put, I was hoping that that would yeah. really happen. Uh, but yeah, the reason why I'm taking that position and I, I'm defending it behind. Uh, I'm especially thinking like Mignolo, especially coming from like Dussel and all this modernity coloniality mm -hmm. movement. Uh, they, there's some. Um, so they start writing about this mid 80s or later, which is like after these indigenous movements, the capitalists and all, like discussing my paper, are making clear claims that they want to have like a, you know, that their worldview should be respected, that uh, there is not such a thing as one humanity, that there should be multiple ways of engaging and all that. And then modernity coloniality as a movement comes in and basically talks about the same things but from the point of view of epistemology with like much more academic oriented, which is fine, they can do that. Uh, but what has happened, and that's like a debate that's going on now and it has been going on for a few, five years or so, is that uh, these indigenous theories that like created this are now not being able to be published or not being able to like advance certain kind of things. Uh, and they are very critical of this sort of clientelism that Mignolo has established throughout Latin America, because he's like such an influential and powerful figure. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I say take it out of the streets, I mean into the realm of like this like situation that I call. Mm -hmm. I'm talking specifically about this. Like, I I completely agree that critical thinking can lead to revolution, mm -hmm. uh, for like a better word. But in this case, this sort of like you know high level realm in the universities. United States American universities mm -hmm. uh, tend to be kind of clean in that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's not like the universities in the 80s in Bolivia, which like were really pushing for this sort of social change and recognition of difference. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm mostly like trying to take sides with uh, Silvia Rivera Cusica because like put, talking about this very dark things, me other just like. Right. You may be able to thread it thread yeah. more throughout. I, the, actually, the, there's yeah. a longer version of this paper where I'm like trying it out, but it would be long right. enough already. So. Yeah. And also the castration thing. <laughs> right. That's very gendered. So that's also something to think about. Right. Oh, yeah. You want it to be gendered oh, in that way. I mean, I might hesitate personally. <laughs> but, right. but um, you know. No, you're completely right. Yeah. I didn't even think about it. OK, cool. Um, well, else. So yeah, what you mentioned about literacy as being like this implicit binary between colonialists and colonized, I completely agree. Like I'm departing there basically from Michael Rama and La Ciudad Letrada, and also from these indigenous theories I was talking about, who, you know, in their political struggles, they are trying to, they, they're trying to merge binaries and trying to say things. Uh, and I, I mean, I guess that's just like my, in general, it's kind of my skepticism on theory, because it tends to be very not mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure if you see this at a close level, you will see that there are a lot of people that are, you know, leather and yet go, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not such a simplicity binary. So I agree with that, but I'm not really sure how to like address it. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and, 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 yeah. Right. I mean, I would just encourage you to read some of the literature that pushes against that and then see any? what you think of. Let me talk to um, my right. colleague Christine Bach, okay. and she'll have the best reference. Not that we, like, in Glenda. This is a question I've been having for a while, and I don't know how to address it. So that's, yeah. thank you. That's good. Uh, I mean, there was so much uh, <laughs> and about the, this, the, this uh, structure of montage. Uh, actually, that's something that Oin does very openly. Like, I, I don't know if you know this, but their opening, their closing concert has the same repertoire. And like, a lot of what they do, they are also trying to play against this, uh, you know, an iteration of temporality. And that's also a very common thing that you see through indigenous writers. So I was just trying to bring from there. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, good. I'm glad. Not not exactly everything that I wanted to say has already been covered. Oh. So, yeah, but, 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 but I'm glad. But I'm glad that you guys that you guys got into it. Um, the some. Yeah. Let me just say what I have to say. Um, first of all, it's really good to have your introduction about how you were worried about pulling punches in this, and that that was your sort of your process for this. 
because for me the experience in reading this was, especially because you're, so you talk about the temporality first, that's your sort of opening candle, which I think is really useful. Um, and, and one of my points is also form, which I'm going to come back to in a second. And then the, after that, we have this um, anecdote of people, you know, um, jeering the concert. And my assumption, maybe it's your language, or maybe it's my assumption, was that this was going to be like defending this group of people who were your ethnographic. So for me to go through this, my process was, no, oh, but Felipe, don't you see? Like, don't you realize that they're relying on this whole European thing? And then you're like, da da da, da. And, you, and then all of a sudden on page 21, I think it is, out of 35, there's this moment where you're like, actually, oh, well, actually, let me find it. That was on purpose, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll, just, I'll, I'll talk about what I think um, is gained and lost by the, by the formal aspects. Um, so for me, the moment I'm, you know, where I'm, I'm reading this, and, you know, I'm furiously writing um, comments in the in the margins, and then at a certain moment, you're like, uh, where is this? I think I put the page down. So. Um, Letter music was a European colonial imposition, which is actually where you want to go after all, in a certain way, right? But it took so long to get there that for me it was very jarring to go through that process. Maybe in a way that's generative, um, but then from there. Maybe. <laughs> then, well, I want to come back to the one thing. I want to come back to the one thing, because there's some I think there's something specific that's about it. Oh, here it is on 24. Without realizing it was the masses who woke him from colonial stupor, mm -hmm. who made him conscious of his indigeneity and cultural colonization. I was like, okay, well good. It, you know, he, this is where he's going with this. And then finally you sort of went and continued, and then we ended up the last word of the of the essay is castration. Um, so I appreciated in a certain way the jarringness of it and having my own sort of understandings of what this was going to be about um, question. And I definitely appreciated the structure that you used to talk to, to, to talk about these or to bring in the um, specific episodes. But I think that what this form does in a certain way by, by stretching out these contradictions as a process instead of exposing the simultaneity of these both halves of what's going on here, you really leave out this sort of, to use a word that, um, that Bridget used, the texture of what that experience is like, of the kind of moral complications that are there. Right. So it, it, by structuring it in this really, I mean, it's the, the trajectory at, by page 24 is very clear. Right, which is a kind of a long, a long time to take for the trajectory to, be, to become that clear. But, that, so that's what you're going after. I'm like, okay, but I think that what you lose by that is by is the is a kind of understanding of what that what that feels like, right? What that means, what the ramifications of it are, and I think that another, um, you know, the sort of binaries of letter of lettered and written and all these sorts of things, uh, the sort of binary between the the you know coloniality and resistance, which I think can be are, are in some ways set up in these really sort of Manichaean kind of overstated, perhaps sorts of terms, perhaps um, <laughs> that I think that the form in some ways is what's responsible for that. I know that you right. are aware that these things are more complicated than that, right? And you could see it, but I have to go through the experiences of reading it in order to sort of fold the two halves together and see what is simultaneous or what is sort of impressed on top of the other. So that's the disadvantage of the form. Um, and so the, you know, you, you mentioned something about is this, you, you end up at a certain point at the end um, and you asked in, in your introduction of the piece, you know, is this, is this problematic? And I think that, I mean, if we think back, problematic is a word that we academics uh, use a lot, but if you think back to where it comes from, from Althusser, problematic is the thing that you start with. This is the thing that makes you be like, what? Right? And then follow that. Right? So yes, this is problematic. This is your problematic. Right? This is the material's problematic. And I think that it might be better served by following some of these things in a sense that's a little bit more or or I'm not. I can't give you suggestions about how to structure it because I'm really I'm really fond of the you know 1980, 1513, 2014. Um, 
because because it also works to bring that in. But I think there need to be moments in those vignettes where history um, is is kind of felt, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that there's certain there's certain issues that you might use in order to get at that. One thing that I was really struck by that you went through very quickly in the in the colonialism section was this idea of the colonization of the senses, right. which seemed like in a certain way uh, you you kind of brought it up and disposed with it very quickly. But what's happening and what also avant-garde aesthetics are are an attempt to precisely to sort of jar the senses in such a way. I mean, this is kind of you know Rancière 101. This is how things change. This is how worlds change, right. right? When people hear differently, when the apparatus, when the sort of the division between the um, between sensation and perception, right? One is sort of raw experience, the other one is sort of processed. This is this is how these sorts of projects happen, right? Both for missionizing and colonization and all of that, and for the avant-garde. So I thought that that might be a productive an example of a productive way to try and bring these sorts of histories together. Hmm. Another thing that I thought was really, um, that, I, that I wished you had a little bit more of was you, uh, one of the categories that seems oversimplified is the idea of indigenous, and for that matter of right. colonial, right? And, you know, racial formations work in very, very complex ways, and in the Andes, the idea of being indigenous may have something to do with dress and language as much as sort of physiognomy, right? right? In fact, probably much more, right? right? So there are moments when you bring up the idea of being of being indigenous in ways that seem to me to really leave off precisely what it is that you want to talk about, which is the ways in which these kinds of histories of modernity, of colonization, of resistance, of sort of cultural resilience or sort of or just alterity kind of come together. And so overall, um, but that, that would be another example of a way to try and bring in the sort of texture of history as something lived in the present and as itself carrying these kinds of contradictions. Right? Um, what else? The, the last thing, this is kind of a more minor point. I'm curious about your sort of economy of citation. There's a lot of moments right. where you sort of, so you bring in, um, you know, Baba and, and Mignola right at the very end to kind of, you know, um, Spit in their face. I mean, I'll spit in their face. <laughs> yeah, ah, you know. Castrate them. Um, castrate them. <laughs> yes. Or be castrated by them. Well, I'm not sure what, it, I'm not sure what, it, what exactly is the right metaphor. But, but, you know, in the, for example, in the 1513 section, you have this long section that's like, um, I mean, it's 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 very moving writing, but in some ways, it's it's things that Latin Americans are very familiar with as a set of ideas. It's kind of like you writing through Galliano or 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 some of that stuff. And so maybe there's another way to do that. Number one, to cut down on the length. Number two, because you clearly, I think you need to write that, but it doesn't necessarily need to be here. And then third of all, to be more explicit and to name names about whose ideas you're engaging with and what it means to to do that. Right? I mean. You, so you talk very specifically about um, about the, the composers and the musicians and all of that, but you're also drawing on a whole body of literature right. that I think can be sort of constructively used, and certainly there are ways in which they themselves are autocritical, just like the indigenists are autocritical, just like the European avant-garde is autocritical, and to give it that sort of kind of make make your analysis a little bit more sort of supple in that sense. That I, I sense that it, I sense that it is like that by the time I have gotten to the end, but I don't have that sense. As I'm as I'm reading through it, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's right on the spot. Actually, <laughs> uh, it kind of came from like when I first started writing this, like in this this you know, this place, temporal order. I had no idea what I was getting into. Like it, it was so hard to write it. Mm -hmm. And the original version, the one that I sent to poor Professor Madrid here, it was much longer and it was much more disorder. Like this kind of trying to divide into halves was kind of like a way to try to make it more legible. Because the reason it was like very like ideas that were like really not matching. So try what's this way to try to give it a, a bit more Can I say something just to interrupt? I thought it just, I thought it was really interesting that you started and ended in the same place. Yeah. I don't know if I really love that or if I really dislike it. I'm not <laughs> sure which one. But it was but 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 the intentionality behind it is is, is definitely well taken. That was and Professor Smother, it's that's that so <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I just started with the 2016 section. Uh -huh. uh, anyway. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's like I've been trying to figure out how to like make this readable and like engaging without what doing that. 
something that I try, I think it's in the section, it's the one where I'm talking about like the pedagogy and how these people are like trying to work through horizontality and being liberated. So I like put like one paragraph that is a critical learning perspective, one that is positive, one in, one out. And that kind of works, but I was thinking if I do this entire essay, I'm gonna like go crazy trying to write it. <laughs> but I don't know if, if you have any opinions about that, if that would be a way to address this sort of... Like alternation, like right. alternation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there might also be some ways to just in the in the practice to sort of signpost things a little better. Right. Just to be like, to sort of foreshadow things in a way that you don't necessarily have to, you may want to, but you don't necessarily have to reveal your hand completely. But just because I was reading this like really kind of in a, in a um, not, not in an exciting sort of way of this is like disjunctive, but in a kind of like, wait, is this really put together? And by the time I got to the end, I was like, oh, he ended where it started, and there's this trajectory, and whatever, whatever. But going through it, it was, it, it seemed, yeah, so you might want to just signpost, foreshadow, or right. say, say cryptic things that later become clear. You know, whatever, whatever it is that, that does that work for you. And right. citations. So, yeah, and yeah. citations are, are so key. Yeah. Especially with that 1513, originally it was like much longer, and I started with a lot of citations, so I had like Duce, I had like Galeano. And that was my idea, just so I had like six theories, really. And then I, that was my summary of them. Uh, but yeah, I just cut it out because the background was one. That was basically it. But yeah, in general, I found I find it really hard to like write through this. And I, I don't know if you guys have the same experience, maybe this can be a collective thing. But like, you know, I developed these ideas thanks to reading theory. But when I have to write it, I find it like very cumbersome to be saying, okay, and then this person say that, and this other person say that, and then turn. It, I don't think it reads well, right? I think like, yeah. well, I wrote reads much more fluently, but yeah, then that doesn't ascribe to academic citation practices, which is. It's not only a matter that it's a matter of, for, for me as a Latin American, is to read it, I'm like, oh, coloniality. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like, that's part of, you know, the. Oh, right, I see what it means. You see what I mean? Well, and, then, and then, but you don't study it, but you do it. So the, what, what it comes, the way it reads it is. So I found this idea to call you know, and, and Latin America was colonized. And I, I know you know that. I know you know that everybody knows that. But by you writing through the process, or by you showing us your process of writing through it, it, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, okay. it doesn't read. I mean, it reads well. The language is compelling. But I'm kind of reading this like, okay, yeah, yeah, the Spaniards came, and you know, like, right. of well, course, right. This is in a way. This is like their paper I'm writing about things they mm -hmm. and I. This is the first time I'm presenting this with Latin American in the room. Usually I'm just like by myself. <laughs> so I kind of have to make a point that right, right, right. anything else yeah, yeah. is like a thing, right? Uh, so yeah, I think it's more responding to that. Yes, yeah, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess I'm time out. Okay. Thank you, you Larry. You could keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so thank you. And yeah, we have time later, we can come back to this. But now we have Julio, who's going to talk about Julio Estrada. By the way, Julio Estrada is going to visit us on the fall. He's going to give a, one of the, what's the name? Barwick Colloquiums. OK, so first, uh, disclaimer, kind of in self-defense. I'm not a musicologist. <laughs> uh, but, no, but this is also because I think part of the feedback that I would like is not aimed toward a dissertation or an article writing or anything like that. But um, part of what happened was that I started writing about Estrada, and very specifically about this piece in Mictlan. And then I realized that a lot of the questions that I had uh, reading through his writings and his art, the interviews that I found um, with him, and even the emails that we exchanged were common to a lot of us, I think, uh, composers working um, who working in the new music environment who are from Latin America. Um, and some of the some of the or something that I found was that he had uh, like a public discourse that doesn't actually uh, match with, he, with our private communication, and that created a lot of confusion, I think, with. Uh, people who are doing work on him. So some of the things that I read were very focused on his ideas of the imaginary music, the continuum, and how that might relate with um, Breton or even um, even Freud at some point. And something that I, I 
I thought it had almost nothing to do with the actual uh, his actual music, which I find is interesting. Um, another thing that was very uh, problematic, I thought, was that he always talks about his con his idea of the continuum in relation to the UPIC, Senakis's uh, tool for composition. Um, and I think that the, the uh, intention of the UPIC is almost fundamentally uh, the opposite of uh, what how Estrada uses the concept. Um, so basically, the way it works is uh, Senakis developed this tool for um, uh, for composing, where you draw lines on a board, and they are almost immediately translated into sonic waves. Um, so I was going to actually play it there, but it, I think it doesn't matter. I can just play it from here. So this is an example of what the drawings look like and what and how it sounds like in the end. Let me just play it here. The idea is that it's, uh, you can very clearly see how intuitive the tool is in uh, translating what is drawn uh, into sound. Whereas Estrada's drawing, drawings look something like this. Uh, so he just takes very large pieces of paper and starts drawing lines very much in the way he drew on the, on the tool developed by, by Sinakis. But then these lines are assigned to different parameters uh, in each of the instrumental lines in the piece. So for example, it could be this, this line corresponds in the end to pitch, and this other line corresponds to bow position in the string instrument. And then um, what actually comes out in the end is a combination of these parameters that have has little to do with this idea of an imaginary uh, uh, of an imaginary music in the sense that he means it, that I think is, he means it in a very intuitive way of imagining a sound and, and uh, making it uh, materialize in music. Um, that then also becomes very problematic when he talks about how that is a way for him to access some kind of dead pre-colonial uh, sounds that are lost. Um, the way he does it, I think, in, in this piece in particular, is by taking Rulfo's novel, uh, Pedro Paramo, and imagining what the sounds in the book might be like, and uh, using the percussionist, with, with who he calls in this piece a uh, gridista, as uh, the translator of these sounds in, in a very little way, literal way, where he takes even uh, grains of corn and uh, amplifies them or rocks and rubs them together and things like that. Um, so something that was interesting to see also, which I uh, I talked about with or I discussed with Alejandro when I presented the paper for his class, was how this was connected with um, the release, the role of the release in, in Mexican soap operas, which is basically uh, the person who makes the sounds that are, that are on TV or in the radio at the end. Um, so anyway, so all of this uh, ended up being um, more of a general inquiry into what, uh, how you, we might deal with tradition in a way that is a little more productive. Uh, unfortunately, in the paper, it's the very last, so it's in three sections, and the two first sections focus on first on the relationship between Senakis and Estrada then on this piece in particular. And then by the, by the time I started going into this uh, like very com complex subject, it, uh, it just became something like infinite. I, I didn't even know where, where it would lead. So there's actually not, no conclusion, I don't think. But if there, is, there are ideas as to how 
that can be addressed, that would be very useful. Can you say a little bit more about what kind of feedback would be most useful to you, since this is not headed toward a dissertation or an article or a publication or something? Um, well, there was there's this uh, this thing that I tried to explore a little in the in the S in the paper about surrealism being kind of um, almost like a prerequisite in any kind of uh, description of what experience in Latin America is like, mm -hmm. uh, which I think Estrada to a certain point uses as a tool for. Um, I don't want to say publicity, but to validate his work, I think. Uh, and something that I think would be useful would be like, literature on this subject, uh, particularly on the idea that all of this surrealism then has to take a kind of a primitivist perspective of um, uh, finding this, well, what Estrada describes as this lost sound from uh, pre-colonial times. I think you should go first okay. this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay. Well, so some of the things that I've written are not going to be helpful, so I'm going um, <laughs> not look at those for you. But the indigenismo is something that there's a fair bit of literature on, and and this kind of it's o that it is always a fantasy in the 20th century uh, to a certain extent, right? Because it's you know you, we can look at some of the stuff from Chavez writing the same things, you know, in, uh, when he does uh, Sochi Pili in 1940 at MoMA, right? And I think uh, Leonora has an article on that maybe uh, on that particular sort of reclaiming an Aztec identity from this kind of fantasy about what it is to, to that is based upon an evolutionary point of view uh, in music, right? Um, it's not specifically about surrealism, though. Um, it, there's, this, there, there's this aspect to the paper where you're w working through the Hinduism, and I was like, wait, like, why are we rehearsing these things that there's, there is a lot on? Um, and if I had known particularly that you were looking for those, let me, I can sort of look through some of that and send it to you, but, um, but I'm not sure that that really squares the circle of thinking specifically about surrealism mm -hmm. and indigenismo and how we consider um, uh, a composer's words. On that note, you know, we're not under any obligation to consider a composer's public words to be true, right? <laughs> Especially in a world of like necessary self-marketing um, for various kinds of purposes. Right, you know, similar to sort of what Ian was talking about with sort of the need to use certain kinds of language to get certain kinds of support, that that need not dictate how we view the composer's works and particularly, you know, uh, feel any kind of essential contradiction with their private communication, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty natural for most of us, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, the problem there is that most of what I found written <coughs> on Estrada then follows this same kind of, uh, the same kind of discourse that he uh, publicly. That he yeah makes public. Mm -hmm. So there was like a lot of lack of uh, of criticism of Estrada's discourse in in what I found mm -hmm. on him. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I have other things, but they're not yeah. necessarily useful on this question of indigenismo and that. My comments are a little bit disorganized because I wasn't quite sure exactly what, yeah. what he wanted to do with this piece. But I, I think it may be productive to just bounce sure, yeah. off what I, what I thought as I was reading it. I thought uh, Estrada, I didn't know Estrada before, and I, yeah. I can listen to some of his music as I was reading this, and I, I couldn't find the exact piece you're talking about on Spotify. But I found others, and this thing about um, these tape pieces, I feel that like the, the dust, the, the sound of the wind is clearly a, a major thing in all his work, which I thought was really neat how it relates to this particular piece. Mm -hmm. And I found his work very interesting, and the particular piece that you discuss, totally worth writing about. It was very engaging, and so I really like that middle section mm -hmm. where you talk about the piece. Um, it's very interesting. Um, the indigenismo thing, I read it and I thought, I'm not sure why you are discussing it. Because at least from what I read, it didn't seem that it was the, that he was particularly interested in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, that didn't do much for me. The part that did 
uh, that I really got into was the very end when you talk about magical realism. And Rulf was a magical realist and one of the early uh, part of the Latin American boom art, uh, authors. That made a lot of sense because it seems to me that that Estrada is aligning, perhaps not explicitly, with that critique of magical realism. Yeah. Estrada seems like a very smart man who's not speaking for the indigenous um, Latin Americans, but is basing a high art opera, an experimental opera, on an experimental author. This is ruled for not the indigenous artist, but high modernist mm -hmm. writer. So the fact that the, um, the novel or the novella has this, all this weird organization and structure, he borrows that. So I feel it's, it's, he's purposely picking up high modernness to write a, a, a reflection on that. And Rufo is writing in 53, 55, which is so Stockhausen and Boulez. So I feel it's a very conscious choice of using that and a very cosmopolitan Mexican as well. It, he's very well known, he's internationally renowned. That I think there's something interesting there in just picking up rule for of a composer who studied in Europe and who's so there's something there I think that is very interesting, but it doesn't to me to engage with indigenismo, mm -hmm. but with more cosmopolitan discourses and the boom more broadly. Um, at the very beginning of the of the piece, you talk about that you may consider sort of the experience of a Latin American composer writ large, and I started shaking. I thought, what is he going to say? But it doesn't appear in the paper. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I was like, oh, that's great. So, but in your introduction, I bring it up because in your introduction you mention it again, and I, my personal thing would be, don't do it. Uh, it's. We, I think we move beyond that idea of having to write about all Latin American composers as, as the, there was any kind of commonality. Mm -hmm. If anything, you're going to find commonalities between composers who, are, who write very similar types of, let's say, pure music or experimental music in certain university centers. But I don't think that's very interesting. I think it's richer if you just contextualize Estrada richly and complexly. And then if I read it from Chile, I'll feel like, oh, that's a lot like this one or mm -hmm. a Colombian. But I wouldn't, even if, if you know other composers or if it resonates with, with the way you are seeing things, I wouldn't, I don't think it's much productive to go there. Can I interject that to that point? I, I wanted like a little more context about Estrada and that's with some of this like where that's maybe not that useful to you because you're not going to write an article about it, but depending on who you want to be speaking to about Estrada, like his birth date, for example, or uh, when you say he's been doing this the last 35 years, like is that his whole career? Is that part of his career? Like what, which, what are we speaking about when we talk about Estrada and giving him more rich contextualization in that sense? Sorry, I interrupted. Oh, that's fine. And uh, I work on Bolero, so the appearance of Chavela Vargas in this experimental opera, I was, we were, <laughs> Melody is in a class with me and we were just, we've been reading about Chavela Vargas and the fact that she is brought in to sing, I don't know the particular song. Yeah, I couldn't find it actually, it's not on, it's not on YouTube, but her but, version. But it's a song about, uh, it's so Chavela, it's so uh, provocative in that it's a song that this woman sings with a, um, from a male perspective, it's to another woman. I don't remember the title, but it's gendered. So it's using Chavela Vargas as the queer icon that she is mm -hmm. um, to talk about the 50s when she was one of the very few lesbian singers who, who was received at that throughout Latin America. That to me as a musicologist interested in gender and queer studies was like, wow, there's a gold mine there. Mm -hmm. And it may not be your interest, but um, I, I wanted to hear more about sure. um, yeah. Uh, and I wonder, like, is, she, is he making Chavela Vargas sing these very complex melodies? No, no, or she, is it like a she, act, no, no, she actually she, she actually sang that song in 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 between movements of the opera. Wow. Yeah. 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 Uh, the song is actually mentioned in Rulfo's book, so that's why it's even there. Yeah. And so Chavela flew to Madrid, I think, where the premiere was, and she sang between two of the movements. Wow. Like, so but it's mind blowing to think. <laughs> I haven't listened to that piece, but for everything that else that I listened to of his, 
to, to hear a song by Bechabella Vargas in the middle of this opera for a composer who thinks clearly about uh, continuities and the continuum and no breaks, how did he accomplish that and how does he solve mm -hmm. it? It seems also very worth writing about. Mm -hmm. And the, the only other small thing is that I love the fact that this is an unfinished opera. Mm -hmm. Which I feel, if there's one thing that Latin American composers have, <laughs> it's unfinished <laughs> opera. <laughs> so I thought, oh wow, that's a great concept to write about, like unfinished <laughs> opera, like things that never are completed because the funding never comes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's what I have. Thank you. I also wanted to kind of add just a little bit that there's this discussion at the beginning about thinking through sort of. Um, <coughs> Getting over is the wrong word, but uh, like working past questions of just thinking about somebody in terms of European models. I believe that appears kind of in the introduction. And then the next thing that happens is we talk about like Xenakis for yeah, right. a fair bit of time. And I kind of, I was wondering, I, you know, I think it's an important question, uh, this relationship, his use of this tool, but then like <coughs> not, you are like, really mediating the idea of it. But I wonder if, if that's the aim, if there's a way to talk about it first in terms of what he does, and then to then to say like it relates to this other model. Like any time that you can sort of speak first about what's happening in a clear way, or alternatively, to give like a really clear description of what you think is before going into, into a style. Because it, there was like this weird kind of in-betweenness where it's like he uses this model to do this thing, but then the model I didn't understand and how was it, right? So that I, I felt like I was kind of um, grabbing at both parts uh, mm -hmm. uh, in an incomplete way, yeah. Okay. But then if you really want to give Estrada a voice, like a central voice, that you could maybe speak more about his work with that and then kind of can maybe bolster it after that. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right, thanks. So, first is Julia. Second, we have like 20 minutes and like we have all this faculty here. I, I guess like if we can ask questions in general of the discipline, then I have one. How, <laughs> 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 uh, how, how do you choose a dissertation topic? Like what makes a good dissertation topic? Most of us are pre-dissertation, so for that I think everyone is pre-dissertation here. So, uh, and actually it's sad. I haven't started writing yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, I don't know. It's a thing you can't stop thinking about. Yeah. And that, that remains problematic, precisely, in a sense. I was going to write about two. I started off doing research on a kind of popular music in Colombia called Champeta. Um, and I thought to myself, and then I started hearing this other stuff from Pacific Coast of Colombia, traditional music. So which one I read about, I read about both. And then I thought to myself about sort of spending the next however long years of my life with champeta music, um, which is a kind of popular music, which is of, kind of dubious tonality. It's, it's awesome, it's amazing. It's this whole sort of like loudness culture. And I thought to myself, musically, aesthetically, the thing that sort of moves me also is the, although I don't, it's, I'm not a super, um, I'm sort of more on the Marian side of the music <laughs> thing, I, you know, but, it's, but it, 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 it moves me more. Um, and so that was part of my decision. I've changed my mind about this topic as the years have passed and I've advised more students. Um, I used to think that it was mostly like passion driven, mm -hmm. like something that puzzles me personally and that I should write about the music that I really cared about. And, and I don't think that anymore. I think, especially because like this is our job mm -hmm. and we need to get jobs and we need to fit in departments I think I think it's very important to think about what in a way what the field needs mm -hmm. um, obviously I, I wouldn't recommend to anyone doing something that you don't really care about you need to find a balance but I, I, I can I wouldn't advise just passion um, and I think really be open in the early stages of talking about your advice or more than one reader what do you identify as things that need to be done 
like just ask that question. Doesn't mean that if they say you, tell you something that you have to do it, but it, you consider it and it give you also a frame of how to look for things that that are needed. Um, like in a way, I look back with nostalgia to the times when in music college you would come to your advice and they would say, yes. you know, the ballads by my show haven't been written. That's what you would write about. You're like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, so yes, having that conversations with their advisors or with people here, like I think, and, and there's also you have to think creatively. Maybe at first this one thing may not be that interesting, but if you look at it, maybe you can come up with something in between and make your contribution. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead. Uh, Wait, yeah, yeah. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to move on. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, well, I just want to say that uh, the way that I decided on mine, uh, and, and I think it's a sage issue, thinking about disciplinary boundaries, um, is, uh, um, is that I felt like it was a way of looking at a problem in the field and yeah. with the repertory that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. Right. And that there was support for. Right. I could work on, like, a nice one, two, three punch. <laughs> Yeah. I could describe how I came to my topic really briefly. I've always been interested in aesthetic modernism and avant garde, and I've also been interested in displacement, forced displacement. And, um, and, and when I came to Harvard in 2001, uh, it was a very different department. And um, I thought I was going to write about Stravinsky, which would have been a, a, a really normal thing in the department. Um, the other members of my cohort wrote, they all wrote about composers. So mm -hmm. one person wrote about Liszt, one person wrote about Josca, one person wrote about uh, Mozart. And um, and then I ended up, um, I, I happened to know the music of Stefan Volpe from my undergraduate years because my professor happened to be the president of the Stefan Volpe Society. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I really liked the music, but then it was only once I was in graduate school that I came to think about the extent to which I didn't think um, modernism historiography grappled with questions of displacement and forced displacement, mm -hmm. and um, and then I ended up following that project. But I was told that Volpe would be an albatross by multiple people, mm -hmm. um, and even once I was a junior faculty member, I was told, you know, this he's a Kleinmeister, like this is going to be a problem for you, and and and, 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 it, and it did caused some professional, I mean, like not in the long term, but there were some short term professional problems where you know, I was writing about a white male composer. Um, and it's a white male mo high modernist composer, but it's also very, it was very hard for people in the field to recognize this is someone who actually was a forcibly displaced refugee. He was displaced 30, you know, he crossed borders 30 times in one year. His, you know, his, there is a lot of violence that he and his family suffered. And, and it's a, a racial, you know, it's racialized. Like it was very hard for the field to, to yeah. think through to understand how a white male mm high -hmm. modernist composer could also be dealing with questions of racialized violence. Mm -hmm. right. And um, similarly, in music theory, like this yeah. repertory is a problem. Like, it's never published about in music theory. I submitted an article to Spectrum, and they didn't even send it out for review. They just right. said this is not the kind of work we do. Right. Mm -hmm. So it is so boundary like. Boundary issues are important <laughs> in terms of thinking through like how you're gonna make that work out. <laughs> right. And you can usually make it work, but you, mm -hmm. you have to do the contribution argument. Right. Um, yeah. And another question that you need to ask yourself is how are you how do you see yourself as a musicologist in not, not necessarily only in the, in the field of musicology, but maybe somewhere else. Yeah. Right. In mm -hmm. an area studies or something <laughs> that may be more open to these other projects. No? Right. So just to say that, you know, uh, don't be too narrow about how square you're going to be. It might be the other option. Mm -hmm. I think the serendipity has to be cool with it. I mean, you sort of pick something and follow it, and it takes you in places, and you kind of have to, if you follow it, or if you can think of, even if it brings you to a place where um, you're not exactly sure what kind of work will come out of it, if you continue, you can abandon it. I mean, it's, we, we were just kind of just having this conversation with your comments about um, Ian's work. Um, 
sometimes you can follow it and it will be someplace interesting. Sometimes you have to abandon it. But but in my experience, generally, you kind of end up in these places and you have to think, wait, wait a second, what what actually do I, what can I do with this? What are the sort of constraints that are on me? What are the affordances that this particular project has? And you just follow it and then it'll work. But you have to you have to sort of juggle all of these things and sort of pan back and forth between mm -hmm. these sort of different registers and understanding what your project. May I ask us a like, big question? Um, yeah, uh, I would you know, like to know your perspective on a more practical issue in presenting, on presenting your research, I mean, and especially at this point in which you, you have kind of figured it and you're, you might be either in pre-dissertation arena or kind of developing the research or around the dissertation and kind of having the first writing. So, so first, I mean, when to present and how to share, I mean, those first papers or eventually the chapters of the dissertations, but, but especially, I mean, the, that transition into having, like, figure out your topic and then turning that into a 20-minute paper at a particular event, and if, and if so, which one? Yeah. Well, look at me, I you think about the different kinds of conferences and the characters of the different conferences. And so some conferences are oriented by a particular topic where you're going to get to um, become part of a, of a kind of subdisciplinary community that will help to nurture your work. Um, and, and so I, I would say, especially in the early stages, look for those kinds of conferences where you're going to find a network of people who become invested in what you're doing. Yeah. AMS is a very different kind of conference from that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, S, but SAM, is a more intimate conference yeah, where really friendly, very friendly. Yeah. Is it S A M? S E M. Society for American Music. Um, yeah. 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 Or could be the regional. Yeah. The regional. Yeah. 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 Regional yeah. conferences. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Also, if you put together in the same sort of spirit, if you put together panels, mm -hmm. sometimes with people that you don't know. Yes. So I'm doing something actually for SEM this year, which I've never done before, which I'm kind of scared about. But I would ask one person, um, and they would be like, oh, you should talk to whoever. So now I'm reading people's work while I wouldn't have encountered mm -hmm. otherwise. And now I'm on a panel with them, I'm like, maybe I should you know, have something to say. So to be able to do that um, is a kind of, that I, I work very well that way, with like a you know dagger in my I think it would work pretty well. So, um, so that's, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. But just sort of, you can, you can sort of, for, you have a certain amount of ability of, of agency to make the kind of little communities that you want to be in. And a panel is a good sort of unit of people with the same interests. Yeah. I have been out of grad school for a number of years now. Yes, and. At least at Penn, there wasn't a lot of pressure, I don't know how things are now, um, to present early on. Um, and I, I, so I still like that model. Like the first time I presented at SEM, I was on already dissertation I had already done field work, it was my fourth or fifth year. Um, and I personally am not that crazy about presenting that early. I don't feel that you need to present but your advisors may be thinking differently. Maybe the discipline is so competitive now that you have to be presenting your term paper at a conference. Oh, yeah. I feel that like that can be counterproductive because you go and then you people will receive you because people will be eager. Oh, a new person who works on this, and you're like, well, not really. I'm just trying things out, and then they will force you to keep working on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think regional conferences, um, and I think go when you're ready. And that that first experience for me at SCM was fantastic because I basically waited. I was working on Miami. It was a very good chapter in my dissertation that I published in your book. <laughs> <laughs> I saved it for your book, and it was about Miami. And a Miami conference came up, and I thought I'll do it there, and it was fantastic because I feel like I waited, saved it. And it was, in, it was packed, it's the largest room I've ever had because it was a paper on Miami, in Miami. Um, I don't, but this is a personal thing. Uh, I don't feel that you need to be presenting on every small thing you do. And I'm sure you all write very well, so you, you could get in. And probably you can get the money to then go, but, but, but it takes a lot of time. Then you have to prepare the paper, you'll be nervous. I think it, it's time maybe better spent just going at the conference, hanging out with your friends, seeing great papers. 
The first time I presented at a national conference was when I was finishing the dissertation and on the job market. Mm -hmm. And it actually was perfect that way for me, at least. I felt really comfortable with the material. I felt like I had, like I could handle any question I got. And it also was great for the job market because then people can see who's right. present. And I, that was SMT. I mean, but I, yeah, I definitely did not present early on, except for like graduate student conferences, which are a good space for that, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, for that work, I presented for my second year on. I, I, I liked doing it. The, there's the, the for me the disadvantage of giving a presentation is that because it's oral, because it sort of happens in a moment, the questions that you get at the end are of people who, you know, I'm not saying that I'm a like particularly sleep-inducing speaker or whatever, but just the nature of the beast is that people are not going to get everything. So if you go there with the idea that I'm going to work out these sort of you know tangled theoretical issues and I'm really trying to figure out this thing, so I'm going to present it at the conference, you'll get questions like you know, well, well, I mean, the, the <laughs> questions, yeah. questions yeah. At, at the yeah, it sounds like my work. I mean, yeah. people yeah. listen to people listen to other people's work, especially in that context, to try and figure out how it's useful for their projects, mm -hmm. right? And so the kind of sort of sustained engagement with the the, the subtleties and you know of your of your argument might not be there, and you might get a kind of false encouragement, mm -hmm. right? Where you're like, oh, so I nailed this, so I went to SEM, and I really, mm -hmm. you know, I really got this, and um, nobody had any you know hard questions that I couldn't answer, and then you, you have to confront later what those what those sorts of weaknesses are. So that's another thing that's there. But I I, I actually encourage my students to to present if. For nothing else, just to get sort of oh, past that boundary of being like, oh, you know, it's the, the I have to, you know, make it in the big leagues or whatever. Sooner or later, you're gonna have to do it. So, um, I, I I suggest to my students that we go from here. But you know, uh, yeah. I think it depends on personality, partly. Yeah. And the length of the presentations, right? There's a difference with SEM and SAM both being 20 minutes, which is it's way. I feel like it's way easier to come up with a sexy 20 minute talk mm -hmm. than like a like a talk that people are going to fall asleep in for 30 minutes. Anthropology is 15 minutes, which is crazy. You basically read your abstract. It's like 8,000 people in yes. you know, some convention hall. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's very different. So yeah, you're right. I think it depends on the conference. Any other questions? All right, so how about we take a 10 minute break and then we come back for the keynote lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Going to our first keynote, let me introduce you to Professor Michael, Michael Birnbaum Quintero, who is an assistant professor in musicology and ethnomusicology, Latin American studies, and African American studies at Boston University. He researches the sounded knowledge and practices of black Colombians. His book, Rights, Rights, and Rhythms, A Genealogy of Musical Meaning in Colombia's Black Pacific, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Let's give him a welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been really fun, and this is a, this is a great model. I, I like this. Um, I want to I wanna put my paper up for um, to be, um, <laughs> yeah. Savage. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, and it's good to get to know you also. I'm right across the river, and I, I don't come here often enough, so um, it's good to get to know those people who are here. Um, so this is a chapter. This is from a chapter in my book, which is the one which I feel is the most um, on topic as far as the idea of modernity goes. Um, and so. The title that I put for it, uh, for this instantiation of it, about disjunctive uh, temporalities, um, refers to the idea that actually came through in some of what I was saying about w w what I was saying to Felipe's paper, which I'm trying to figure out, hopefully I have figured out to some degree, how to talk about temporalities in Latin America as sort of repertoires, right, of, or, or, or sort of ethical, um, imperatives or ways of being in the world that are permeable and that people can move back and forth between. Instead of imagining these are um, ethnic subjects, in my case I work with uh, people, uh, black Colombians, right, who are sort of recognized by the state as living in traditional communities and, and that I think there's a sort of foreclosing of people's actual experience 
and the ways in which people move between not only modernity and whatever is outside of modernity, but even between different sort of instantiations of modernity. So what I'm going to be talking today about today um, is essentially uh, the period from 1890 to 1960. And let me just say also, in reference to some of the things that we talked about earlier, I did, as in, in, in the field, I did almost entirely ethnography. And then when I got back um, from Colombia, I started writing history. <laughs> and I was like, why is this? And so maybe the way to think about this, um, the, what I'm going to talk about now is, uh, is starting at a place of a sort of ethnographic encounter which rose which which made questions arise for me that I felt like I needed to understand historically. So in the city of Cali, which is a, um, the, a, a city in the southwest of Colombia, um, there's and it's not on the Pacific coast, but that has received migration from the black populations of the Pacific coast. Um, the Pacific coast is a rainforest region. Um, it's, and it's a place that has rivers that flow from the Andes into the Pacific Ocean. And so the way that the Pacific has been described is traditionally as a zone of isolation, right? Essentially, um, when it was a gold mining hub during the colonial period, um, there was all sorts of economic activity. But once after the, uh, after independence and after the, um, especially after the abolition of slavery, it sort of, um, it, it's talked about in these terms of sort of reverting to this sort of just rainforest. And there are these populations that live there that aren't attached to any kind of modernity or circuits of you know, global capitalism or governance by the state or any of that stuff. Anyhow, um, Cali is a place with a large uh, black population that has migrated from the Pacific. And in the evenings there, every day, um, there's like this moment when the sun goes down and this really nice warm breeze comes through and then it gets a little chilly. And so one day I was sitting with some friends from a, a, a Pacific family, um, enjoying the evening, we're listening to the radio, and this guy stops by and he's sort of a friend of the family. And he's totally, you know, in full hip hop gear, which is normal um, among black populations um, uh, in, in Cali and for that matter in the Pacific. And at that moment, just by happenstance, some of, some traditional music of the kind that I that I researched came on the radio. And he sort of this guy walks in and he sort of squints at the the friend of mine who was standing next to the radio and he says, "Oh man, be serious, right? What are you doing? No, you can't play that stuff." And so he you know dutifully you know turned down or changed the channel or whatever. And so this guy was on his way out to a club in uh, a, a black discotheque in uh, in Cali, where most of what they play is salsa and you know some hip hop, some reggaeton. Um, I happened to be there later that night, um, and there's a section, usually maybe four or five songs, where they play traditional music. And everybody sort of stands up, and they'll take like a paper napkin in lieu of the traditional handkerchief, right? And they'll kind of ironically, but kind of seriously, dance all that stuff that the rest of the time they're sort of, um, you know, that this guy in particular was complaining about, and in some ways... Do you mean traditional music of the Pacific? Traditional music not of the, the Pacific. Caribbean. Yeah, not of the Caribbean, not of any place else, but from their hometowns, which people are regularly going back to for over the Christmas season. And, you know, all of these people who, um, may, uh, who for whom a performance of a kind of modern, uh, well, there's different kinds of modernity, as we'll see, um, or sort of go back and sort of celebrate, you know, living in a place or being in a place where there's no, you know, there's no running water, there's no roads, you bathe in the river, you poop in the river, you do everything in the river, right? Um, and so that's what brought this, brought this sort of set of questions um, about what I'm going to talk about today. Um, what I'm interested in is the kinds of feedback, interference, and overlap between different experiences of this music. That is to say, the simultaneity of multiple sort of experiences of this music which are coded historically in different kinds of ways. Um, what I want to talk about specifically in this period um, from roughly 1890 to 1960 are, are three different kinds of musical practice slash behavioral repertoire slash ethical dis disposition that the black inhabitants of the Southern Pacific engaged in during this period and which sort of cast you know, shadows over um, Things like what I observed um, with my friends sitting out in the in the in the patio that that evening. Um, one is local traditional music, um, which had its roots in the transculturations of slave society during the colonial colonial period. 
And let's just take a, a, a moment to listen to some of that. Um, depending on the tender mercies of the Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> So this is a kind of music. I can sort of show you what this looks like. There's a Um, secondly, I talk about the kinds of music associated with black aspirations to bourgeois respectability and full citizenship in the Colombian nation. That's a, uh, another uh, a brand of modernity, I would say. The music of, for example, municipal wind bands is one example of, a broad, of this broader kind of disposition that I call aspirational respectability. Right? This is about a sort of respectability politics. Finally, oh, and let me give you an example of that. Um, this is from uh, brass bands uh, in the northern Pacific. Where's this? And there are also some similar examples in the southern Pacific. repertoire I want to deal with, and I mean that in the musical sense, but also as a kind of behavioral repertoire, um, comes from the integration of the Pacific into the larger world, which impelled contact between black populations in the Pacific and non-local black populations from the US and the Caribbean, primarily through the circulation of recordings of black music. I call the black Pacific appropriation of black Atlantic, and I mean that in a sort of Gilroy sense, musical models, cosmopolitan blackness. So here is a, an example from 1960 of Buenaventura, which is a, a city in the Pacific coast, Mambo Band's version of Duke Ellington slash Juan Tissel's uh, Carib. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure, cool. sort of multiple positions are staked out in relation to one another. It's a kind of ecosystem, right? That all of these are simultaneous. It's not enough to look at the wealthy white merchant class of the Pacific at the turn of the century and how they despise marimba music, or, but rather perhaps to describe the terms in which that disparagement takes place. 
And this has to be cross-referenced with, for example, what are the musical ideologies of the elite itself in the Pacific. Um, I also want to take a moment and focus on some on one of the terms that drives this chapter, because when I presented it before, people asked me, what do I mean by modernity? And I actually mean it in a very sort of um, mundane kind of sense. Um, in broad strokes, I mean it as a uh, borrowing from Charles Taylor, market-driven economic models, the infrastructure of trade and mobility, state bureaucracy and provision of services, secularism, uh, ideologies of progress and the rule of law, literacy, urbanization, commodity consumption, and individualistic self-understandings, and modes of interiority. In other words, technological, political, and cultural. Right. So I mean it in that sort of broad sense. Um, however, I'm primarily interested in the ways in which modernity as a cultural system, as a cultural system that props up an economic and political order. As such, I focus particularly on how what is meant by modernity encompasses ideologies of leisure and work, the ordering of space, the management of the body, sublimation of sexuality, the cultivation of sentiment, the transformation of nature, and the proper comportments of citizenship. Of course, modernity is also deeply tied to the colonial project in ways that make modernization essentially homologous to westernization, or in the context of Latin American culture and racial mixture, whitening. Nonetheless, another characteristic of modernity is its seeming universality, inevit inevitability, and its historical or temporal nature. That is, that it is a historical progression to an enlightened modern after from a benighted primitive before. In the period I discuss, Today, the terms often used were, were savagery as the before and civilization as the desired after, which I think is common in, in Latin America. Um, in this sense, part of the project of modernity is the construction of its own exterior, the construction of its foils. In the case of the Southern Pacific, traditional music and the life ways of Afro-Colombian peasants, locally embodied by a figure called the chimpa, which I'll re be returning to in a second, is that extra modern foil. But I don't want to posit that modernity is totalizing. It has taken numerous forms across the world which are deeply idiosyncratic. These so-called alternative modernities are the result of differential degrees of technological and social modernity and attraction within local cultural systems. Um, in the Latin American context where millenarian cultural practices and social configurations coexist alongside and entangled with the most recent forms of, for example, digital culture and technology, Commentators have long characterized local forms of modernity as fragment, insip fragmented, incipient, and incomplete. But much as it would be a mistake to reify the subgroups that constitute the black people of the Colombian Pacific, that is to say that there are class positions right, within the body of, of um, black people in the Pacific, it would be a mistake to take even the local alternative modernity as a totality. In other words, again, back to this idea of repertoires. And I'm also inspired in this by uh, something which is kind of a, a classic uh, trope in, Cari in uh, Caribbean anthropology, which is the idea of respect and reputation uh, put forward by um, it's Peter Wilson, not of, the, not of the Beach Boys, but of um, uh, an anthropologist who worked in San Andres in Colombia and in, and in Puerto Rico. And the idea behind this is that people move back and forth um, as ways of staking out class and even racial positions in a more sort of fluid uh, racial economy, we might call it, um, by means of performing different kinds of behavior, particular sexual behavior, such that um, respectability um, is often a, ways, a way in which um, women are generally confined and men, older men, are um, sort of uh, making, making claims to prestige based on their ability to provide for their family versus the idea of reputation, which is sort of out in the street about, about male spaces in which men are going out um, and having uh, extramarital affairs with women and so on. And then often that these two sort of move back and forth and inform one another, right? And so I'm sort of interested in that, but in this sort of tripartite um, setting that I, that I had mentioned before. Um, I'm interested in my project about the idea of musical practice as a heuristics of moral lack. So again, a bit of contextualization is in order. By the middle of the 19th century, the Pacific Coast, which in the previous century had been an important gold mining center, had been abandoned by the absentee owners of the enslaved labor that worked the mines. Left to their own devices, the black miners simply walked away from the authorities, spreading out into the rainforest and moving beyond the slender authority of the newly established state, which was concentrated in Colombia's interior. 
From the point of view of Colombian nation builders on the other side of the mountains, the Pacific Coast remained a frontier, wild, thinly populated, with minimal participation in the national economy or political institutions. In a word, unincorporated into the Colombian nation. Hinterland regions like the Pacific Coast and the Amazon were, pre were a preoccupation for, uh, for nation builders in the 19th century. So in the 19th century, there were all these expeditions that were sent out from Bogota to explore the territory of the new land, um, looking specifically to survey natural resources, population demographics, and geographic figures that might conceivably be transformed into commodities, or into markets, or into labor pools, into transportation infrastructure, uh, and so on. And of course, their conclusions in the Pacific, a rainforest region thinly populated with some uh, Afro-Colombian um, uh, residents and, and a few uh, indigenous residents, um, was pretty pessimistic. Um, so much so that the entirety of the Pacific was officially declared unoccupied land. The same period saw the rise of new modes of race thinking in Colombia, as race, race shifted from the colonial calculus of honorable lineage toward a metaphorics of morality that explained the intrinsic suitability or incapability of particular spatially and racially marked populations for participation in the mainstream or in modernity. Uh, so the spatial and the racial sort of configurations are very similar, they're very much isomorphic of each other. Where the spatial project prescribed political and economic integration, the corollary racial project promoted whitening or blanqueamiento. Blackness became a sort of racial periphery to this process, analogous to the unassimilated territory of the hinterlands. So if we imagine sort of modernization as a process, as a kind of metabolic process, right, by which um, these sort of different raw materials are, are sucked into the, the engine of, of modernity with civilization or capital or, or what have you sort of coming out the other side, these are the sort of the leftovers or what has yet to be absorbed uh, into modernity. In this 19th century shift in the concept of race in Colombia, into these terms that I just described, from an idea of honorable lineage during the colonial period, music has tended to be viewed as an epiphenomenon resting on already regnant notions of blackness. However, notions of black musicality were not only central to the diagnostics of race in, in the 19th century Colombian Pacific, they were themselves part of the organizing logic by which racial distinctions were made. So, um, in other words, elite observations about black musicality were made to sort of diagnose the racial condition of, um, of uh, black uh, residents of the, of the Pacific. And there's a couple ways in which this worked. One is um, in terms of uh, temporality, right? Not only historical temporality, I mean a sort of more phenomenological register. Um, music, of course, is a practice that occupies time. Um, and as musicologist Richard Leppard, writing about a totally different context, um, has written, music was understood um, as a quote-unquote productless entity. So um, for the, by the European bourgeoisie, even before the industrial phase of capitalism. For a class whose most important motto may have been, time is money, music was seen as the epitome of waste, an encoding of the power over time. And so one finds in accounts by the nation building elite of the Colombian Pacific, the number one thing is how can they spend all their time making music? How if they, and you know, and they don't really have like good things, they don't have nice furniture, right? So clearly they don't want to work. Why would they want to spend their time doing this, right? It is not it is not productive. Um, the second thing that I think is important is the ways, uh, for music, is the ways in which it um, puts forward a kind of what uh, Angel Quintero Rivera calls a somatology. That is to say, a sort of way of occupying the body, right? Um, which not only is a matter of the body itself, but sort of reveals the moral capacities of the soul, right? The management of the body is, uh, reflects the, the, the moral capacities of the soul. And one of the uh, sources that um, Quintero Rivera looks at is, number one, etiquette manuals. And, and one that I look at in turn is dance manuals, right? And so uh, dance manuals and etiquette manuals during this period of time, um, for example, uh, the, uh, the Carreño, um, yeah, Carreño, which is still in print in Colombia from the 19th century. Um, those of you who went to school in, 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 uh, in Colombia may have been assigned this book about 
urbanidad, urbanity, um, or etiquette, um, these prescribe a kind of mastery of the body, a kind of bodily continence, um, expressed through, in, in, in the dance manuals, expressed through rigidity and per perpendicularity, which of course is precisely the opposite of the bodily comportment of Pacific traditional dance forms. Mm. Despite the fact that marimba dance is traditionally bereft of erotic content, in fact, sexuality is often explicitly separated from the, from the marimba dance in, in traditional context, um, observers in uh, newspapers in places like Tumaco and some of these urbanizing um, settlements talked about the lack of gallantry between the sexes. Um, and so, you know, the physical movement of precisely those parts of the body where euro creole musicality prescribed rigidity authorized the use of black musicality as incontinence, intemperance, and a lack of bodily discipline, making it right for explanations of black dance as sexual transgression or violence. This despicable dance, concludes a columnist in Tumaco, proves that people of color are more inclined to exalt their passions up to, I'm sorry, I lost my page, up to exaggeration, up to, I have to read this last word for you, I can't remember what it is, but it's very funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Up to delirium. Yes. <laughs> so music was understood as a node at the interstices of the body, visibly marked by a race, and the central instrument of the labor necessary for the transformation of hinterland peripheries, that is to say, by work, and interiority, a particularly modern construction imbued with the moral and spiritual faculties necessary for proper citizenship, sociality, and capitalist labor, accumulation, and consumption. In short, elite accounts of marimba music were a site for the construction of a deeply felt correspondence between blackness and an underlying lack of bodily self-control. Um, this idea not only related to bodily self-discipline, bodily self-discipline, but evoked precisely the idea of savagery which premised the social and economic project of carving civilization out of the hinterland jungles. These are urban settlements that were set up by uh, elites um, often immigrants from abroad, some from uh, the, the, the central parts of Colombia, um, to get raw materials from the, from the rainforest. So there was this boom in something called tagua, which, um, which fueled the making of buttons until plastics were invented and then kind of went by the wayside. Um, but that was, a, that was a, big, um, a big money maker. And so these populations, the black populations, began to arrive in the cities to, to a certain degree. Um, I want to turn from the use of music by non-blacks to adoption of the, of the bourgeois musical repertoire by some black urbanites. And this is what I call the aspirational respectability, by which I mean a repertoire of emotional entailments, bodily comportments, moral principles, and musical and social behaviors, generally borrowed from Colombia's Andean center or from abroad, that performed civilization against tropes of savagery, that modeled respectability around the lyrical erotics of romantic love, the bolero is, is important, I think, in this. Um, and that sought the possibility of being home in the nation at large, rather than, or at least in addition to, the Pacific specific. Through aspirational respectability, black Colombians cast their lot not with cultural difference, but with hopefully colorblind, um, but generally not, but hopefully colorblind, Republican notions of citizenship, with notions of middle class respectability, and with Euro modern imaginaries personhood. Aspirational respectability, in other words, claims social, claims social equality by enacting prestige and cosmopolitanism. The idea here, essentially, is that um, within Mestizaje, blackness was understood as a lack of whitening. Blackness is sort of a blank slate upon which civilization or modernity or um, uh, could, be, could be inscribed. So many black Colombians sought to efface race in order to enjoy citizenship by modeling behaviors, behaviors of aspirational respectability. Um, certain kinds of musical performance provided black men with a repertoire for the performance of respectability. Black men and boys were a significant part of municipal wind bands. A Tumaco newspaper describes them as, quote, young artisans who, after the hubbub of the daily struggle to make a life, consecrate a few hours to the cultivation of the sublime art, end quote. Uh, Pascual Biafara, violinist, trumpeter, and director of Tumaco's band from 1910 to 1914, was a black man, as indicated by his surname, Biafara, um, who was not only entrusted to give piano lessons to the daughters of the white merchant elite, but also accompanied their salon gatherings, in which poetry was declaimed, 
arias sung and waltzes performed on the piano. And for these very small towns, they seem to have at least one newspaper, um, usually feuding with the other newspapers of other political tendencies, of which there was probably 15 people that read them. But they, they have some discussions of the events at these little um, soirees, and they, and they mention Pascual Biafra particularly. Um, in the northern Pacific town of Quito, black musicians, often of rural origin, described membership in the local brass band with its uniforms, prominent public appearances, genteel musical repertoire, and training in musical literacy as itself a form of social advancement. Black aspirants to social mobility were also avid consumers and dancers of respectable and cosmopolitan repertoires. There were sarsuelas and, and operettas, as well as theater, magic shows, and concerts performed at the theaters of Tumaco. Quote unquote, refined blacks, restricted from musical gatherings of the white elite, held their own balls and dances in early 20th century Quito. These social gatherings described as white glove affairs certainly did not include the much maligned marimba music, which would have threatened their precarious social, social prestige. Indeed, the black band leader, Biafara, is reported to have tried to, to introduce the respectful and patriotic Andean Bambuco to Tamako's Christmas celebrations in a public concert, which the people boisterously rejected in favor of traditional music. <laughs> is this the 1890s? This, this is 1910s. 1910s. Yeah. It was then precisely black as aspirants to the middle class that were most preoccupied with performing the mannered bodily <coughs> musical comportment that could differentiate them from the purported backwardness of the black lower class. That is to say, it was even more necessary for black, uh, for, uh, for black Tumaqueños and black urbanites interested in social mobility to perform this kind of super respectable music than for whites, who in, at, in the end were white and often came from money families mm -hmm. and so on. Beginning in the 1930s, black Colombians, particularly in the growing port city of Ramatura, began to find an alternative to aspirational respectability. And one of the reasons why this was necessary is because um, if we start to examine um, the trajectories of, uh, of black urbanites in the Pacific, there was sort of a glass ceiling. The, the, per the performance of, uh, of middle class values and so on didn't actually give them the capital to um, you know, open the shop that bought the ivory nut and so on. Right? That they, were, they weren't allowed to attend uh, you know, the most prestigious schools and so on. So um, there, was, uh, there, was, there, there were limits that were there. So beginning in the 1930s, black Colombians, particularly in the growing port city of Buenaventura, began to find an alternative to aspirational respectability that afforded a new version of modernity that re-signified blackness. This is what I call cosmopolitan blackness. It emerged because the implantation of modernity in the Pacific was not only an imposition of Euro-modern ways of being, but also a moment of contact with other black populations. As Lees Waxer describes in The City of Musical Memory, um, by 1935, Buenaventura had become a major port city, in part because of the opening of the Panama Canal and because of a rail connection between the coffee growing region in Colombia with the Pacific coast. Um, many of the, of the sailors arriving from the US into Buenaventura and the Caribbean were black men, locally referred to as chombos. Waxer's informants repeatedly cite the importance in Buenaventura of the Chombos as the embodiment of a kind of black cosmopolitan cool. Their manner, worldly, their hairstyle, comped, their dress, quoting Waxer, a tropical version of the Harlem Zoot Suit, complete with Panama hat, two-tone shoes, watch fob and chain, and walking stick, all swathed in a thin cloud of very verde cologne. And their dance style, <laughs> quoting Waxer again, very Caribbean, with some steps that totally revolutionized the concept we had of dancing. I should say, quoting one of uh, Waxer's informants. The Chomos offered to black Buenaventurans an alternative to both the unreconstructed rurality of the stereotypical black peasant and the mannered mimetic bourgeois respectability of the elite. And they brought 78 records by the crate loader to sell. Significantly, these records prominently included Cuban and Puerto Rican music that was understood as black. Firstly, she notes, because of passing references in the lyrics to blackness, and secondly, because of the predominance of African-derived musical aesthetics. 
which were understood in those terms. I, I, there's, I think there's some questions to be asked about what was that moment of recognition like, and how did, what about those sounds allowed people to recognize themselves in it? Um, yeah. Many women, women on Twitter saw these uh, black Caribbean and to a lesser extent US artists as well, visually, um, modern, zoot suited, cool, uh, in one of the city's two cinemas. So imagine this sort of setting in which blackness is something that needs to be totally um, you know, unmentioned, right? which is the, a sort of a symptom of coming from the rainforest. And all of a sudden, you see Benny More, right? or you see um, uh, Nat King Cole, or you see um, you know, any of these, uh, any of these um, particularly black male um, hipsters, right? And the sort of original sense. The most radical aspect of Jumbo cosmopolitanism in the Pacific was as a position towards race. This was no mere black cosmopolitanism. Now, what do I mean by that? Black cosmopolitanism would be a cosmopolitanism practiced by those who are black, right? A black way of being cosmopolitan. No, this is a cosmopolitan blackness, a notion of what it means to be black that is itself cosmopolitan in form. By disconnecting blackness from the stereotype of unreconstructed rural bumpkins, the chimba, and hitching it to the sounds and images of cosmopolitan modernity, it allowed a path to modernity that differed from aspirational respectability's pursuit of racelessness. It is significant that it took the arrival of foreign black sailors and their music for blackness to be, inserted, to be asserted in the Pacific. This is not, however, atypical. At the same period of time, black Caribbeans, Latin Americans, and Africans in Africa were looking to the big hubs of black modernity, Harlem and Havana, a function of what uh, Paul Gilroy has described as a quote unquote outer national and intercultural practice by which Gilroy, different local conceptions of black particularity flow into one another. End quote. A situation intensified as the global dissemination of black popular cultural products has coalesced. Oops, I lost my place again. Uh, has coalesced. <laughs> has coalesced into. <laughs> has coalesced into a global circuitry of black cultures. All right, we know Gilroy. I'm not going to go through all this stuff. Um, so the question that remains is how traditional music was able to survive at all. Not able to survive, like why traditional music, right? After all, in a genealogical approach to history, and that's sort of the after the colon title of the book that this comes from is um, Rights, Rights and Rhythms, A Genealogy of Musical Meaning in Columbia's Black Pacific, right? And so I take very seriously this um, sort of uh, idea of Nietzsche's sort of through Foucault's to look at uh, history genealogically, which means in part that we cannot escape the uninterrupted continuation of any historical development, right? We can't understand, we should understand the maintenance of something historical, not as mere inertia, but as an active process. For something historical to continue, something has to happen. Not that nothing has to happen to stop it, Right? But it has to be sort of maintained for whatever reason. And so that's my interest um, in thinking of this third repertoire of, uh, of uh, the sort of realm of the traditional. So it is important to recognize that residual traditional forms were not always disarticulated by modernization in the, in the Pacific. Traditionally, a central function of musical gatherings, whether religious drumming for the saints or children's funerals, the mass singing of adults' funerals, or secular marimba dances was to articulate social networks between members of a single extended family, among neighbors from the same village, to nearby communities along the banks of the same river, and even beyond the pale of the human world, to dialogue with divine figures. Even as rural people began to settle in the larger towns and cities, Tumaco, Barantura, patterns of urban settlement by which members of a family and people from the same hometown and home rivers, because there's usually a couple villages along the single river. Um, these they settled uh, in such in the in the larger towns and cities, sort of around the same places in the same neighborhoods, which allowed this new kind of institution, the folkloric family. In the in the rural context, folkloric families were uh, you know families that included musicians and whose homes became the scene of both marimba dances and religious ceremonies. 
and these continued to form the epicenter of circuits of nucleation through traditional musical practices. So in towns like Guapi, the homes of large extended families, each from a different area of the Guapi River and its many tributaries, became central nodes of social networks along which marimba dances and arrojo ceremonies, religious ceremonies, were organized, from whom singers could be found to preside over funeral songs and so on. Traditional music articulates the rural social network, modeled by family and hometown, extended in traditional religiosity to saints and spirits. That is to say, basically what happens in traditional music is that a relation is made with one's family, the people who are from that community, and that the saints in particular are, are made a member of the community. That's precisely what sort of religiosity in this context is about. That's what music does. It articulates the, um, these, these uh, spirits and saints and, and these sorts of figures along with people. So this social network, mediated by specific musical practices, is the web through which goods, services, favors, obligations, and modes of care circulate. This musically modeled community can be, and often is, fractious. That is to say, not like everybody's really happy to see each other all the time. This is a community, and communities can do lots of things. Mm -hmm. um, its constituent, the, the constituent entities, human or non-human, of these communities um, can be capricious. But these constituents are usually known quantities, family members, gold mining, which is the traditional um, uh, subsistence practice, uh, and the saints. The rules of the game are fairly clear relative to the potentially baffling factors encountered in urban modernity. White people, the economies of the job market, or global commodity prices, the state, and so on. So even for modern black urbanites, occasional visits to the ancestral village or participation in traditional music's articulations of sociality can help maintain one's presence in these networks so that they can be reactivated if the necessity arises, which it often does. Nonetheless, the social networks of traditional music are not entirely external to modernity either. So in fact, beginning in the 1950s, the church started shifting away from throwing marimbas in the river and so on, and using traditional music as a means to missionize, as did some of the local merchant families um, in towns like, uh, like Wapi, in which um, they found that the kinds of vertical um, clientelist sort of networks that were necessary in order to start a tuna canning plant or to start a, a lumber, uh, what's it called, a maserio, or like a a lumber yard. Yeah. Mill. Mill. Lumber mill. Yeah. 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 All I can think yeah. of was. Yeah. yeah. So in order to get sort of labor in these sort of mini industrial practices by these entrepreneurial elite families from other places, they found that sponsoring dances was a good way to sort of make these kinds of relationships with people. Um, in Guapi, the lot. You don't care. <laughs> so I've laid out these, we can think about these four different uses of music in the sort of um, environment that I've talked about. For aspiring to respectability, for participating in modernity as blacks, and for consolidating social networks peripheral to modernity, right, when people don't have access to, um, you know, jobs or, or cash money or, or whatever. Um, I want to return to a central theme which is how people move between these modes, right? which I think is actually the important part. Um, anthropologist Norman Witten, uh, who's emeritus at uh, Champaign-Urbana, did his field work in the area in the 1960s. And he notes that traditional and cosmopolitan music, musical practice were by no means mutually exclusive. I quote him. Quote, people attending a kurulao, traditional dance, say that the saloon music, music in a bar, is very bad. Very bad that the dancers there do not know how to dance, and that there is no respect. Saloon goers, who are listening to records, right, or jukeboxes, um, saloon goers insist that the music in the kurulao is very crude, the rhythms cannot be danced to, and there is too much respect associated with the old generations. But, and here's the important part, the same people do attend both kurulao and <laughs> young and old, and in the respective context, make the appropriate remarks about the other context. <laughs> What appears to be at stake is different, asynchronic, but always available forms of social affiliation. 
each involving a different kind of music with different attendant value systems and forms of behavior and sociality. Witten notes that people's attendance of either a saloon or marimba dance depends on the availability of cash and the particular utility of saloon or kurulao social networks. The former, the saloon, is useful for drinking with patrons and fellow members of a work gang who reinforce their economic relationship through the ritual exchange of liquor and dance partners, or who find new sexual partners. The latter is for the articulation of family-based social networks of kin-based solidarity. I said family-based and kin-based. I'll edit that out before. <laughs> um, I would perhaps expand the purview of Witten's model beyond a strictly economistic take to suggest that the two musical forms Witten offers hinge more broadly on the particular forms of sociality and sets of cultural values possible or necessary at a particular time and place. Um, so, for example, it's the kind of music that, that takes place to this day when migrants from the rural area, areas and their children return to their hometowns for the December season, or in some places for Holy Week, to rearticulate their hometown networks. Um, as such, traditional and popular music and the behaviors that accompany them each comprise a repertoire of social, cultural, and aesthetic forms for confronting particular experiences. A similar effect takes place with the use of the rather insulting term chimpa, which I mentioned before, denoting an ignorant or out of touch person, a hick. The word is, deeply, is a deeply generative category through which black Colombians from the Pacific make reference to the local, the cosmopolitan, and the modern. Um, the pervasive notion that the chimpa makes engaging with traditional music always a somewhat vexed or ironic endeavor, particularly for black urbanites like my colleague acquaintance that I, that I mentioned above. The figure that might be described as the chimba spoil is the chombo. The chombos no longer dock at the ports of the Pacific, but any Buenaventura home with a DVD player, um, one, and now a computer, um, one can often see hip hop videos from the US in which fashionably dressed black men and women drink champagne, dance, and generally provide a specifically black version of the good life that echoes the worldly swagger of the chombos. Attributions of chimpesa, of chimpaness, operate along something of a sliding scale. This is what I think is interesting. It is always someone slightly further outside the grid of modernity that is being called a chimpa, even if the person speaking is subject to being called chimpa, him or herself. So in Buenaventura, my friend Segundo called his sister Jenny a chimpa because she doesn't have an email account. <laughs> Jenny, in the rural village where her father was born, called a young man named Nelson a chimpa because he was always trying to mooch moonshine. In an even smaller settlement, Nelson scolded a child of about 12 years. Take a bath, you stink, chimpa. <laughs> Calling someone else chimpa is in many ways a move to make oneself appear more cosmopolitan by contrast, but it also means engaging in a certain ironic self-deprecation, in that even as people call someone else chimpa, they're potentially subject to, be, to being called out as chimpa themselves. The gas cylinder is empty, and Barossa calls her daughter Jenny to cook on the wood stove behind the house. Jenny says, this green-eyed mulata blowing the embers on a wood stove like a chimpa? Jokes, Jenny. You're crazy. Jenny is dark of skin and eyes. <laughs> is not at the expense of her poor black, is not only at the expense of her poor black chimpa mother who let the gas run out, possibly because she didn't have enough money to buy a new one, but also at herself for pretending to be less of a chimpa than her mother when she is just as poor and just as black. This is a classic example of what Michael Hertzfeld has called cultural intimacy, a kind of, quote, rueful self-recognition of the parts of one's cultural identity that are considered a source of external embarrassment, but that nonetheless provide insiders with their assurance of common sociality. Traditional music operates in much the same way as the chimpa concept. The disparagement of marimba music by the black inhabitants of the Southern Pacific is like the stereotype of the chimpa, a local appropriation of the logics, racial, spatial, cultural, that have been applied to black river dwellers since the 19th century. As I showed in the first section, or as I showed above, um, it is, however, a deeply productive category in that it is available for the micro-politics by which individuals jockey for small gains in social status in a situation in which the vast majority are relegated to a starkly abject position. While a macro-political critique would aim to overturn the local use of such categories as chimpesa or of coloniality right, or indigeneity, 
Everyday interactions are perhaps more modest in their goals, more localized in their understanding of the we of identity politics, and more skeptical of the possibility for overturning categories in the first place. Overturning them would also make them unusable, not only for the negative use of bringing another down to bring oneself up, but in one's ability to inhabit and even enjoy them. I want to conclude by, um, by thinking this through in the context of, of the present, um, and specifically in a context of neoliberal multiculturalism in Colombia. Colombia in 1991 declared itself a multicultural uh, nation, and um, in fact, the music that I, that I speak about, traditional marimba music, has become something of a resource for uh, grassroots social activists and for individual musicians as ways of positioning themselves as black in a way that's advantageous. And so blackness, <coughs> traditional blackness, becomes a certain kind of capital that can be used. And I'm interested um, to think about this, um, who is, who has, how these different sort of regimes of blackness play themselves out in the present. It's one thing to be in the city, a musician who's able to put forward this sort of you know, authentic traditionality, and it's something else to be you know, a little kid that's um, you know, a, a black uh, child displaced from violence in Barantura who's squeegeeing uh, um, you know, windshields at a traffic light or you know, juggling fire or, or living in the, in the slums. Um, and I, I appreciate what Elizabeth Povinelli has to say in um, that first book of hers. She makes a, 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 a comparison that I, I don't want to quote it, sort of at length. Says Elizabeth Povinelli, Franz Fanon and members of the School of Subaltern Studies have suggested how colonial domination worked by inspiring and colonized subjects a desire to identify with their colonizers, aspirational respectability, says, says me. Multicultural domination seems to work, in contrast, by inspiring and colonized subjects a desire to identify with the impossible object of an authentic self-identity, a domesticated, non-conflictual, traditional form of sociality and intersubjectivity. As the nation stretches out its hands, for example, in folkloric music festivals and the like, indigenous subjects are called on to perform an authentic difference in exchange for the good feelings of the nation and the reparative legislation of the state. But this call does not simply produce good theater. Rather, it inspires impossible desires to be this impossible object and to transport its ancient pre-national meanings and practices to the present. I'm not as preoccupied as Povinelli with the impossibility of an authentic self-identity, although I do agree with him. What I find troublesome about multiculturalism in Colombia is its inability to recognize the multiplicity and contingency of people's experience. In other words, I'm not so worried about the essentialism of the politically inspired strategic essentialism, um, for example, by black urbanites auto-exotifying themselves on the stage of a folklore festival. I'm more worried about the strategic part of strategic essentialism, the focus on large-scale strategy rather than the constant micromaneuverings of the tactics of everyday life, to refund a certain. So I think that ethnomusicology needs to take seriously the multiplicity of musical experience. It is not only ethnomusicologists that are by or try musical after. I think that's all I have to say. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So technically, we have ten minutes for questions, but we probably will need a little bit more. We can go ahead. It's open for questions and discussion. Can you still book time? Yeah. <laughs> End of this year. Awesome. Congrats. Michael, I'm wondering because you started with this anecdote of this guy calling the other guy um, Jimba. So I couldn't remember. Did he use the same word chimpa that, that you were tracing later down? He actually he actually didn't. Um, but in a similar interaction, that that would be that word that word would be in the present. In the present. Yeah, in the present. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It's like a hick, or a yeah. But it's just, but it's but it's but it's blackness is very much foreground. Okay. Yeah. And I was wondering. This may be nothing to do with it, uh, but the. Um, 
the music that I've studied, the ballada, and how that music is considered of being of bad taste as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in clubs, people will play it, and also in a kind of ironic way, people will emote right. to it. And I know that in Colombia, they refer to ballada as musica de plancha. Yeah. So I wonder, would somebody call, somebody who likes ballada and listens to his music for irony, would they call him chimpa? Would that apply, or is it a different? Very different. Yeah, this is specifically about specifically right. Colombia Pacific. Okay. Yeah, um, Bogota is uh, and Bogota is a whole different, a whole different, um, a whole different thing. And the plancha thing, it has a kind of irony to it, right? The performance. Irony. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's a paper title that has to be. Which, which I think that to a certain degree, people in the Pacific don't have the same ability. They don't have the same sort of accumulated capital to be. They can sort of be ironic in maybe black settings, but but not necessarily. Yeah, I don't know. It's a totally different. It's a totally different. Phenomenon. But I do want to say something about baladas and about baladas and about um, about bolero also, which I didn't really um, mention. Which is that there are also sort of post cosmopolitan blackness takes mm -hmm. on aspirational respectability specifically through the bolero which is this kind of like these sort of takes on you know romantic sublimation right that but nonetheless are very much working class mm -hmm. right so in that sense and the guitar repertoire which comes out of that which is very important in the Colum in the Colombian Pacific and which informs the version of, of um, caravan that we heard sort of comes out of um, sort of an urban working class perf performance of aspirational respectability through these globally circulating texts of romantic sublimation like the bolero. So um, Benny More sort of has two modes, or any of them, that King Cole, mm -hmm. right, has these sort of two modes. So that's sort of tucked in in a place sort of in between aspirational respectability and cosmopolitan blackness. Although I think that the real sort of black middle class will sort of sniff at that at, at boleros. Mm -hmm. but, but then maybe run off and you know, particularly the man would run off and you know listen to them some business. <laughs> oh, just to add to the, the chimba thing, um, in Bogota, I mean you said it's like and I don't know how much that fits into into that. It's like this weird dual meaning word and which meaning is pretty much uh, kind of dependent upon context and, and upon expression because chimba could be both, I mean, so this clear a pejorative or as you call it, degenerative situation. Like, and it applies to musica de plancha, like, like bolero, uh, yeah. chimba, so it's not good. Mm. But at the same time, it could be chimba, like really hip or great, yeah? So yeah. it's una chimba, and, you know? So, mm -hmm. so it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's both things at the same time. So at the same time. I think of brega music in Brazil, as maybe a good example. Mm -hmm. Brega in Portuguese yeah. is like kind of cornball, I guess. Yep. Maybe the best translation. A goober. Like, what? Goober. Goober. <laughs> this is goober music. Yeah, so, um, you know, what it means to sort of, or what's the other one? Charme? I don't know if Charme is quite as pejorative, but, um, but yeah, so there's, there's something that's generative about that. Also, it's, chi it's chimba is something, is, is one, this is chimpa with P. This yeah, German, and I'm not sure what the etymology of that is. Oh. I don't know. I really, I have no idea. Um, but it's you hear it all the time, mm -hmm. and sort of references to it are common. You go to one town and you're going to the other town there, and they'll say, "Oh, you're going to the you're going to the woods," mm -hmm. right? Like this this sort of index of this of the of the civilizational and yeah. the savage sort of just is layered across all different types of things. Mm -hmm. so you turn left and it's one. You turn right it's the other. If your soap is blue, if it's laundry soap, that's chimpa soap. Mm -hmm. If you buy like ivory or looks or not looks, mm -hmm. um, like a white soap, that's like actual proper bath soap. And, um, many of those were secondary sources, but some of them were primary sources as well. And I sort of, you know, I I I photo I photocopied them and I had these huge boxes of photocopies, um, some of which I still haven't scanned. Um, and I had those to sort of go back to when I started asking these questions. And then I discovered from a uh, there's a dissertation that someone wrote about uh, about these sort of early urban contexts um, that I talk about in the aspirational respectability section. And um, she talks specifically about um, about these common these elite commentators and what they had to say about black music, um, or black music practices, or the musical practices of blacks um, during this period of time. So I went and started looking at some of those, and I found that they were really rich sources. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to go back to Colombia. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Wonderful. Yeah.
question. Um, <coughs> I enjoyed this very much. Um, in your, when you lay out your three genres or your three repertories, and then you go back and say, but where hence traditional music? Um, and given the context, given the, the fact that this is a historical chapter or you're covering a historical period, I was just struck that the, um, the way you describe traditional music as empowering social networks or as being a way that people connect with oh, across spatial, you know, spatial distances or through familial uh, connections or even kind of supernatural connections. Um, where, since this is coming in an historical chapter, are you making that connected, that, the case for that kind of connection and that kind of, um, the work that that traditional music does, are you, are you saying it, it works that way now and it worked that way in 1890? I'm just wondering, at, because it seems like it, without specifying uh, a historical period for that maneuver, then you right. fall into the same trap of making a traditional music timeless, right? Right, 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 right? So I'm just wondering where, how you see it functioning historically and whether you, is that something you, you found in the in the archive or in your materials, or is it something you see in ethnographically? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I should make the qualification first, which is that the um, these other kinds of music also establish kinds of social networks, but they're different. So the black cosmopolitanism network or cosmopolitan I forget, now I forget which one I was arguing. Or cosmopolitan blackness network <laughs> yeah. um, makes for sort of urban cultures of affinity, right? The, mm -hmm. Which is a kind of social network also, um, but it's just a very different one. Um, and the same thing with aspirational respectability um, about sort of you know members of one's class or one's one's own. Um, as far as how I know that this works this way, it's because this is the way that people talk about it. So in that sense, for that for the in this this was the sort of social history part of this. Um, and actually, there's some people that I interviewed who talked about sort of moving back and forth between this sort of urban context. And uh, so there's one guy um, who, who you may or may not know who's in Guanajuato, who's a, a, a well-known instrument maker, and Maribero, who used to live in this, you know, river way up. Guadalajara. No, Guadalajara, no, uh, Cuama, Valdivia, Cuama. Um, and so, you know, he would, his father would host these um, marimba dances that would be attended by people from throughout the river. And this was the moment at which everyone from the highest course of the river all the way down would sort of all be in the same place at the same time and sort of, you know, drink together and eat together and worship the saints together and, you know, and then would sort of disperse, right? Um, but he also would go on weekends, he would row like, you know, five hours to Guanajuato, get off his, his canoe and go dance mambo or, or whatever. And so he sort of participated in this book, in both of these, and, and talking to him about these experiences was also was really useful. And then finally, in um, some of the settings in which people talk about the settlement, like so, you can ask people. Most so it, often, you can tell by people's last names what river they're from. Um, but if you start asking people, you know, where are your people from? They'll say, I'm from here, from here. We came to Guapi, or we came to Guanajuato, we came to Tumaco at whatever time, and all of the people in this neighborhood are from whatever sub-river, whatever tributary, whatever town. And um, if you start talking to people, well, who are the who are the big families? Who are the folklore families during that period of time? And they can name these people, and there's these sorts of oral kind of genealogies in the sort of regular sense of the term, of who these families are, who they integrated, and, and what that was all about. Today, this doesn't really exist so much anymore for secular music, but for religious music, uh, or for religious ceremonies, it, it, it continues to. So there continue to be, um, specific ceremonies for the death of children, um, which are parties, which is a very sort of, in sort of Western, is that term I hate to use as a, as a foil when I'm talking about Latin America, right. yeah. but, but let's, just, let's just bracket that. For, so for mainstream Colombian, you know, uh, non-ethno, well, I don't want to go there either. But <laughs> in those terms, for whoever those people are, um, this is a very weird thing to have a big party when a child dies, but this is something that people continue to do in the Colombian Pacific, and you know, it's a thing of sort of showing up and being like, um, you know, I, I am still part of your family. Uh, this is still part of, you know, this is who this community is. I come from your river. I remember you, even if I haven't seen you in many years, and so on. And so, to a certain degree, it continues to hold that function. Although now it is perhaps more often held on stage, mm. the musical styles, than in other places. And you might have a musical ceremony with a, with a stereo instead of live music, mm. right? But nonetheless, it, 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 it has that sort of function. Yeah. 
Uh, I was wondering if you may say a little more about Pedagogio and his engagement with with UK. Um, so I guess this is part of the same narrative of how, how you put it, like black cosmopolitanism? Yeah, it comes cosmopolitan black. Cosmopolitan yeah. black. So I think it's within that narrative. 100%. Um, yeah, so but, but if you can say Yeah, Pedagogio is known in Colombia now as the guy who did urbanized plural music. That is to say urbanized traditional music, which um, is is strange and, and sort of anachronistic in, in two senses. One is that what he did was to really arrange the Pacific guitar repertoire, right? So there's a sort of six, so the Myrtle music that we heard is in 6-8, right? And it has these particular sorts of, um, it has a particular rhythmic feel, which was sort of transposed to guitar um, at, a, at a certain moment, right? As part of this sort of cosmopolitan blackness thing where people, because, you know, as elsewhere in the world, guitars are available all over the place, they're cheap, you don't have to learn to read music to play them, it's easy to transpose if somebody's singing in a different key, blase, 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 we know about guitars. So, um, so this sort of repertoire developed, and really they started adding, like, horns and stuff in, of people who were drawn from these municipal wind bands, right, or aspirational respectability you know, in the town square on, on Sunday and then maybe on Saturday night, however, they would kind of take off with the clarinet and play these dances with the um, with the guitarist and, and, and in this other sort of setting. So, um, in, on one hand, it's not exactly kurula or marimba music that's being performed. And secondly, that was a, a part of their repertoire that they didn't always play. In fact, often they were playing for uh, dances where um, they didn't want to take that, they didn't want to play the Kurula repertoire because it was seen as too low class, right? It was seen as too much associated with chimpa ness. But there's a couple that they did, like for example, Mi Buonantura, which is an absolute sort of sublimated, almost bolero like, you know, Bello Puerto de Mar, you know, he used this whole vocabulary of, you know, the waves come and the waves go and this very sort of poetic language and, and it's very much a sort of elevated. Um, part of this uh, guitar repertoire. So that one they actually ended up recording. Um, and that became, you know, and they recorded a couple other quote unquote cool labs. So they were sort of black cosmopolitans or cosmopolitan, participating in sort of cosmopolitan blackness, um, but are now known as sort of the, 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 the uh, purveyors of a modern kurulao, an orchestrated kurulao, is actually not very much of their repertoire. They played tons of mambos. You know, they play what people were dancing, they would do covers. <coughs> it makes a thing in particular. Just another more risk for the mill. Give me give me give me more of that stuff and mm -hmm. run it through the you know. Yeah. Let's take our kid speak on